as you probably figured out, our guest this week is Jamie Dundee. And with Jamie Dundee being a guest, that means Jamie Dundee style language. So if that's not your bag, or if you've got little ones hanging around, then this isn't going to be the podcast for you this week until about one hour 20-ish in when we then start talking about the news. So you have been warned. Hello everybody, James here, Storytime with Dutchman Tell episode 70. We're going to do the intro really quickly because we've got a special guest all the way from Iceland, as far as I can tell, from his background. <laughs> uh, I will do the in- uh, stuff really quickly. We've got books, I've got two on The Rock and Owen Hart. The links are in the description of this video and every podcast, you know the score. Dutch has two books behind him over his left shoulder, The World According to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. If you want them unsigned, go to Amazon. If you want them signed, why have you got a red gnome? Just because it's me shooting the bird. Fair enough then. And if you want those books and the certificates and everything else signed, you write an email to Dirty Dutchman Tell with two L's at gmail.com and then you make your <laughs> request from there. But for now, uh, oh yeah, I've got two more things. Franchise University with Shane Douglas every single Tuesday on all podcast platforms and on Shane Douglas Official on YouTube. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, there's one correction from last week's podcast is uh, I said the podcast that uh, Ric Flair was on was The Goat and the Pony. It wasn't. It was Kill Tony, and I totally messed up that up. But anyway, apart from that, we're going to throw it to Dutch to introduce our special guest. Go for it. Jamie Dundee. Yes, sir. Where in the hell have you been? Man. Man, James, how how many, how how long did we try to book Jamie? A year? (laughs) At least. Yeah, because I I remember I said, because uh, Jamie first emailed me or uh, uh, and, and said, uh, I want to come on the show. And I went, I can't do it this week. I'm in Turkey. And then I never yeah, heard back from him. Tur- he was in Turkey, mate. Yeah, I was in Turkey, mate. And then I'd never, <laughs> and then I didn't hear from you for seven months. And you just wrote back to me, are you still in Turkey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's because they hear the thing. I went to Turkey and you went there. You're, you're a fucking lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he say? I, I said I went to Turkey and you weren't there. But see, here's the thing. Um, I don't even know where Turkey is. Uh, so I don't have a clue where you was, but I just assumed it was like Turkey, Alabama or something. <laughs> and you, you didn't get back with me. Like you said, you get right back with me. And so a year's gone and now you got back with me. Hey, man, that Turkish internet, what can I say? I mean, it's slow, it's slow to get the messages out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is Turkey. They don't have much. In it. Well, see, I'm in Iceland right now. If you can see by by the by the by the background here, I'm uh I'm up here. By is it Green. cold? Is it cold? Uh, no, no, it's warm here because uh, I'm the Ice Man, baby. JC Ice Man. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about all your career. Uh, huh. That'll take about four minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. That take about three or four minutes. Then yeah, we'll talk about, about your. We'll get all out of here. We'll talk about your other stuff. Now we've okay, wanted the other you, stuff I'm good at. We wanted you on this show for a long time, except, of course, like James said, uh, your locations, locations, yeah, varied. So we had trouble running you down. Well, so, I mean that's the good thing. That's because uh, Dutch. Dutch here it is. Like I don't even know where I'm going to be when this show ends. So I can't tell you <laughs> where I'm going to be. Like later tomorrow, I could be in jail. I could be in Tur- I could be up in Turkey. I could be anywhere. <laughs> Afghanistan. I could be anywhere, man. So I'm just like, you know what? I can do it. I will be there. But you got to send me the link. And we I'm got on, the link. James, this guy. If you just sit down with him anywhere, I don't care. Now, I will tell you, we'll, we're going to tell you several stories during the course of this interview. But if you don't even have to know Jamie and sit down beside him. And in five minutes, you're best friends. I mean, he's never met a stranger. Never, and, never met. And, and he's entertaining as hell. Of course, we're going to tell some stories that I know on Jamie. And every, t- every time we're together, I'm with Jamie. We kind of tell these same stories, but... 
None of the facts changed. It just the inflection in Jamie's voice. And you can tell how he's feeling that particular day <laughs> if he wants to talk about it or not. So yeah. Jamie, for those who have been out in the wilderness for years and years and years, is the son of Bill Dundee. Yeah, that's and uh, that's how I met Jamie. Jamie, how old were you when I first met you? Young. Eight, eight maybe. <laughs> about eight. 1979 or 77. So, I mean, uh, 13, he was 13 he, at the oldest, but I think I was about eight or nine. Yeah, yeah I maybe. think, hey, Louisiana, you were 13. You were 13 when I caught you in the car. Yeah, it caught me driving the car. But, you know, I also like to tell people I am the brother in law of beautiful Bobby Eaton. So, I mean, wrestling is just in the family, man. It is in the family. So, sorry to hear about your mother and your sister and Bobby. Yeah, man. That's good, up, man. Uh, good, I mean, uh, uh, good, good people. Man. Bobby Lee, I just, yeah, I miss him a lot, man. My sister, yeah, it's whatever it is, what it is. But uh, <laughs> my mom, my mom, Bobby Lee, my, Bobby Lee the most, man. I just can't believe old Bob's gone, man. I just, I can't believe it. it that is, that is hard to believe. You know, uh, people, he's talking about Bobby Eaton, who was his brother-in-law, correct? Yep. He married my stupid sister when I was, uh, about nine or 10 years old and uh, yeah. he's been a big part of my life. And you grew up in this business. Totally uh, grew up in it. Very much so. Um, uh, yes, yes, I did. <laughs> right, right in the middle of it. Smack dab in the middle of it. So I got to tell this story, James, this, this, the, the name of the show is story time with Dutch. So okay. I was working in, I'm telling you, I was, I was working in Charlotte Bill Dundee was working in Charlotte and Jamie was over there with his father. So one day me and my wife, we had gone out to eat somewhere and this is about one o'clock in the afternoon. And we pull up alongside this car sitting at a red light. So I'm sitting there like this. And all of a sudden I look over like this. Jamie is 14 years old and he's behind the wheel of this big Cadillac. Yeah, Bill Dundee's Cadillac, too. <laughs> I says, and I went like this, like, roll that window down. So he was too young. You may have been 13. I don't know. I but he was, was much, much too somewhere. young, <laughs> much too young to have a license. And I looked at Jamie, and he's kind of, he's never been really tall, but he was kind of low in that seat. And he looked over and looked at me like, oh, my oh. God. And I went, oh, roll no. that window down. And he <laughs> rolled his window down, and I there. went, what are you doing? He went, what do you mean? I said, why are you driving that car? I don't know. I said, listen, nothing. <laughs> this is, <laughs> yeah, I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. Yeah. I said, I want you to take that car back, park it at your house. Don't drive it again. You hear me? Hey, oh, yes, sir. He I says, did too. Yes, sir. So then when the light changed, he drove off and drove real slow. So and, uh, Jimmy, I tell the Dutch, and I was yeah. waiting, and I was yeah. waiting, and I was he waiting, went. waiting for the ass kicking because I know that ass kicking was coming. Because when Bill Dundee found out I was driving that car, there's gonna be an ass kicking, <laughs> and it was gonna be mine. So what and happened? Never, did he, he never, he never, he never came. He never came for the ass kicking because Dutch did not go and tell on me, man. <laughs> that was the so greatest shit. In my life, I was like, he never told on me. Because see, in the rest of the business, the boys think that's funny or it's a rib or whatever you want to call it to get somebody's ass kicked, you know, by their dad. So they would tell on you, definitely tell on you. But I think Dutch so it did come the first day, right? Too many ass kickings. <laughs> so, so it did come the first day, right? No, no, no. And so I was thinking, but you said, on, oh, it's, it's yeah, it's got to it's oh, got to yeah. come today. He'll tell oh, yeah, him. He'll tell please him. just tell him, Dutch, so I can quit waiting for it. <laughs> Then the second day came, and I still didn't tell him. No ass the kicking. third day, and now Jamie's thinking, no what, the, what the hell? I know they're in the same towns together. Yeah, yeah, something's wrong here, man. Uh, uh, I need to find it. See, if we'd had cell phones back then, I'd have called Dutch and said, hey, why ain't you told him yet? Yeah. <laughs> See, I can't take this waiting no more. And, and you know what, Dutch? We didn't tell him for 30 years, did we? Long we told time. Him in, in, at, one, at my show in 2011 that I ran at the Evansville Coliseum, me and you told Dundee then. We said, oh, by the way, <laughs> in 1984, Jamie, you know, we, you're leaking out. Yeah, I said, Bill, I forgot to tell you something. 
Yes. What mate? What mate? And Jamie's sitting right there. I said, I never told you this, but back in Charlotte, I pulled up and I told the story. Yes. He looked at me like, "Well, you motherfucker." Mother, yeah, yeah. That was that was yeah. thirty years later. You, yeah, and it was thirty years later. So he, yeah. you know, Jamie's grown up now. Bill couldn't yeah, whip no, his. no ass kickings now. No. Yeah. <laughs> and I he don't said, take what? It, no, "Not from him." So, let me ask you this: When you came from Australia to the to the to the U.S., right? Yeah, right, right. Where were you born? In Australia? I'm born in Australia. Yeah, I still have a green card and a passport and uh, the whole nine yards. From Australia? I just talk like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not an American citizen. I'm an Australian. So you're still not an American citizen? No, no. Because here's the reason being, though, because I mean, another, they can't make me leave. Because you know, as as you said, sometime or somewhere, I have so many children, they can't make me leave. So <laughs> they, uh, but but I don't. I'm, I have. I have. I'm, I have the permanent resident alien. I'm allowed to stay here as long as I want. But then again, I can pack my bags and head on to Australia and stay there as long as I want to. How many kids do you have? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they speak English or, or in America. <laughs> or, I mean, I mean, you know, we got me. But honestly, I have five biological children by four women. No, no, by five women in five states. And then I have my two daughters now that I have raised since they were little that live with me and my wife, Angela, or did. They're grown up now. So I have a total of seven children, yeah. five biological, three boys and three girls. I mean, three, uh, two boys and three girls. Okay. How many are, did, did you pay child support? Oh. Uh, none. No, I didn't. I, really? I didn't deal lay, yeah, I'll lay them, but I won't pay them. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Dundee, I can't. You know, listen, if you want to pack your bags and take your kid, then you have. I just got arrested, Dutch. You're not going to believe this shit. I just got arrested a month ago for a child support warrant from 1995. The fucking kid is 32 years old. I told the woman, I said, tell him to get a job. I ain't fucking paying you. So I don't know. I don't know what they want, but I'm not paying them. I paid a $300 bond and they said I still owe them $1,700. I said, well, good. I'm glad to know it. Uh, good luck with that. Seventeen hundred for a kid that's thirty-two. That's yeah, getting 32. all deep. Oh that's yeah, no, no, he was. Oh yeah, he was adopted out when he was four without my consent or anything. It's a, a fucking scam, bullshit Kentucky thing. But anyway, uh, I was just a real. Literally, I was pulled over the other day, and when the cop came back to the car, he said, "Muhlenberg County," and I go. Yeah, what about it? He gave me an address, and I go, yeah, I used to live there. Then he gave me my address to my mom's old house in Tennessee. He said, 3424 Township Road at Antoka, Tennessee. And I go, no, that's Antioch. He goes, does that mean anything to you? I go, yeah, those are the places I lived. Why? And he goes, because you got a warrant. And I go, what kind of warrant? And he said, from 1995. Uh, and I go, from 1995? <laughs> And he goes, yeah, child support warrant. So fucking put me in jail, and I had to pay a three hundred ninety-five dollar bond from nineteen ninety-five. Yeah, yeah, the kid is literally thirty-two years old, and I'm like, well, tell him to get a fucking job because I'm not paying that. I'm not paying it no more. I was done. I did four years in the penitentiary over this bullshit, and I'm not fucking paying. Did you? But did you pay child support on this on this boy? No, no, ever, no, ever. Is, no, no, no. This is in the rearage. That's why they oh. see this is what this is why they're telling me I still owe him, even though he's 32 years old. But here's the thing. And I said, you can't rearrest me for that because I did a four year state penitentiary sentence. I served my sentence out. And this was their response. Mr. Dundee, you're exactly right. We cannot ever arrest you for flagrant non-supported him. But we can arrest you for the rest of your life for contempt of court because the judge has ordered you to pay this and you have not paid it. And I said, "Ain't this a fucking bad? This is just ridiculous." But okay, I'll pay you. But I'm paying them. <laughs> so you, so you, you paid some of it. Well, I, they took the bond. You know, when, when <laughs> I posted bond, they took that three hundred dollars. So there's seventeen hundred dollars. It was two thousand one hundred dollars, and now it's seventeen hundred. Well, let me ask you. The, let me see. It'll uh, take three, six, nine, twelve, fifty. It's going to take them six more times to arrest me and get six more bonds before they get their money. But so you got care. it all. So you got it all figured out. Oh yeah, I've had it all figured out since nineteen ninety five. Yeah, <laughs> I did four years, and so, I told so, you I would have never left jail if they let me get so, laid. I'd have never left. Oh, you took you took my question away from me. I was going to say, 
How many times have you been in jail? Oh my God, I've been to jail a bunch of times. Like just just in the last seven years. I mean, I've lived here for fifteen years, and I've got uh, about thirty three mug shots just from this town, from Henderson, Kentucky. You know, Evansville. And then, then I, I when I when I went and got my driver's license back, I had forty seven driving on suspensions. That because I drove from nineteen eighty eight to two thousand and fourteen with no driver's license, none. How many times you get stopped? Seat. Uh, 47. Yeah. But that's pretty good. You're driving 150,000 miles a year. Don't you think? You know, you know our circuit. Memphis, Nashville, Louisville, Nashville. Every, every, I drove the whole circuit from 1988. I never had a lick of driver's license. And I drove it all the way up to 2014 when the first time that they really put me in jail was 2014. And then I had to go through the courts and get my driver's license back and all that. And the good thing about that is I have a perfect driving record at 53 years old because all the stuff I did was criminal. It wasn't, it doesn't go against your license. So I am 53 years old with a perfect driving record and my insurance is cheap as hell. So for all you people out there that really want to know, just drive like hell, lose your license when you're young, then get them back when you get old and you have cheap insurance. <laughs> I, I did. I didn't realize that. I didn't either because I just thought, oh, no, insurance is going to kill me when I finally straighten my shit up at 53. And it is not. It cost me $68 a year to insure my motorcycle. And it cost me $36 a month to insure my car full coverage. Now, that's good shit, man. That's the re is that the wrestler rate? Uh, no, 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 no. That's 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 the Jamie Dundee right? See, JC Ice, the wrestler, <laughs> that dude is the dude that drove and got me all the tickets and didn't give a flying well, he don't care about nothing. That dude's crazy. Matter of fact, look at that. There he is right there. See? That's him right there. Look, this dude, J.C. Ice. You see that little dude yeah. right there? J.C. Ice. Yeah, he's got a fuck you hand right there. See, he don't care. That dude is crazy right there, man. That Wolfie, Wolfie made that makes that dude come out and get crazy. So uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to bring him out, man. Jamie Dundee has. I pay my insurance. I paid my house off. I, I own my home, my land. I, I sold my that house in Nashville, and I bought all this stuff. Because J.C. Ice, he would have just took that shit to the strip bar, did cocaine, and wouldn't have cared. But see, J.B. Dundee, I, I'm a little more smarter now. That I'm looking to the future. Dutch. Have you slowed down some? Yeah, yeah, I'd have. And it wasn't because of a heart attack or nothing like that. I just got fucking old, man, and then tired. <laughs> I got tired. I ain't got high in 15 years, and it sucked. I, I tell people all the time. They say I'm uh, I'm proud of you for being sober. I say I'm not. Fucking sucks. It's boring. Life fucking sucks. I'd rather be high right now, but I'm not because everybody else wanted me to be sober up and be right. So I'm sobered up and right. But life fucking sucks sober. <laughs> so how many times have you? <clears throat> how many times you been in jail? You think? Oh, 60. My, my 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 daughter said, "Daddy, do you know that you are on famousmugshots.com?" <laughs> Said, so, oh, they, so every time you got arrested, yeah. they took an another mugshot of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got them all. I got every one of them. I love them. A bunch of them, I'm smiling and laughing you, and joking. There's only three or four that I'm not happy You about. actually need to put that out. You I need can to make a book. A, a well, we do mugshot book. <clears throat> well, just won't you just make you a, a montage of all, <laughs> all will, your mugshots? I promise I and will put, do that. And, and put the date on it. And you know what and else? Then sell it, and you'll I'm autograph put it, it. To the song "Jailhouse Rock." <laughs> there you right? go. Hey, Jamie, you, hey, making a trip with Jamie is like—I mean that that trip flies by. I was I was making a trip with Jamie one time, and he was talking and talking and talking. I looked over at him. I said, "Jamie, have you even taken a breath yet?" Oh yeah, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jamie, you remember telling me the about. story? You were in a county jail. Bunch of them. And <laughs> but I think you were hit on this particular one. Yeah. You were Kentucky. you were in there for a while. And you offered, you said you got bored. You offered to paint the jailhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell that story. What happened? Well, I mean, it's one of those see if if when you become what they call a state inmate, you have to get a job. I don't uh, understand this part because, like, I'm in there for child support, but they paid me $63 a month to go to jail. I'm like, well, this is fucking great. <laughs> it's called state pay, and they give you a dollar and a quarter a day times 30 days was uh, 45 bucks or something. 
they've cut it down to now like 60 cents a day now. But anyway, they said, see, they, they try you out on these jobs and you're supposed to go to work. And see, when you work, then the state pays the jail for every state inmate that works. The state pays them a certain amount of money. So you got to go to work. But see, they uh, like they put me on the road crew first. And that's where you walk around and pick up trash and all that. Look, man, I'm not doing that. You didn't like, you didn't like that, did you? No, it was, listen, I walked maybe a uh, half, uh, half a mile and I opened up the door of the van. I got back in, I shut the door and the, like, that guard goes, what are you doing? I go, I quit. <laughs> he goes, <laughs> what? I go, I quit. He goes, you can't quit. I go, what are you going to do? Put me in fucking jail? I said, I quit. <laughs> Take me back to the fucking jail, man. I want to lay down in my rack. I'm not doing this. So look, bro, it, it was the craziest shit. Cause like all the other inmates are like, oh, what do you mean we're going back in? Why we got to go? He's like, no. So he he's like, Johnny Dick face to base. Johnny Dick face to base. He says, <laughs> Dundee quit. So the jail, the lady at the jail says, what do you mean he quit? She said, he, he got in the van and he said he's not picking up the garbage. He quit. So the, the woman said, tell him he can't quit. He said, I did. And he said, what are you going to do? Put him in jail? And she said, well, what are we supposed to do with him? And that guy said, well, I don't know. And I was like, I know, take me to fucking jail so I go lay down in my rack, man. So we load all the inmates up and we drive back to the jail and they let me out. So then the woman says, Mr. Dundee, you gotta you gotta work. And I go, okay, well, what else you got? And she said, <laughs> you can work in the kitchen. And I go, okay. So I worked in the kitchen like four or five days, but you had to get up at five o'clock in the morning. Quit. <laughs> I said, she said, time to get up, go to work. I said, I quit. That woman said, Mr. Dundee, you can't quit. And I go, yes, I can. Fuck you going to do, put me in jail? I said, I quit, lady. She said, you have to work. And I go, what else you got? She says, we got the National Guard Armory. So I said, okay. So then I went to the National Guard Armory in Owensboro. You remember the one that sat in the yeah. parking lot of the National Guard Army, sat in the parking lot of the Owensboro yeah. Sports Center for that? Then I went there. And that is the where I got the painting job. That is uh, his name. I still talk to him today. His name is Sergeant Daryl Riley. He used to pick me up every morning at five o'clock in the morning and they would bring me out to the armory and I would stay there till five o'clock at night. And then he would take me back into the jail, drop me back off. And that is where I started painting the National Guard Armory. And then when it got done, I told the woman, listen, <laughs> I want to go back to the army. She said, you can't. The, the job's all done. I said, well, then I want to paint the jail. She says, well, okay, I don't see why you can't. I said, me neither. So I painted the jail. I went and got five of my buddies, and we all, inmate buddies, I guess, and we all went to our little own little cell. We got, to, you know, because you're like a trustee, you know, because speaking of trustee, that's a funny story. My dad talking to Rocky Johnson, he said, how's Dewey doing? Rocky Johnson said, he's great. said, he just made the Mummy Returns movie, made $15 million. He said, how's Jamie? Bill said, he's great. He just made trustee. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at the time we were both on top of our game though see i was trustee painting the jail the rock was making the mummy returns but we were both where we were in life we were on top of our game man so when that so you tried to make that painting the jail last a little yeah, bit yeah right? well i, I kind of did because <laughs> I, because here's the thing it's kind of it's like job security <laughs> if you paint it wrong then you got to repaint it again. <laughs> so it's job security. I don't want to go sit in a cell. So I just painted and we painted it like purple or some shit. And the woman's like, no, 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 it has to stay gray because jails have to stay gray for some reason. Cause gray is the color that keeps their morale down or something. I don't know. Cause you know, I, I'm not from that world, but I mean, anyway, you can't paint it like happy blue or no shit like that because it makes people get all excited and anxiety up. So they wanted, but we, I, I would shoot that purple, food color and stuff. Uh, we call it Kool-Aid. I would throw that in the paint and mix it up and paint it wrong just so the lady would be like, no, no, Jamie, you can't paint it that color. You got to redo it. Oh, darn, we got to redo it. So it really, I did I did it until so, I so, served out. So how, yeah, how long How long was that term? Uh, that, 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 like I did a four-year sentence, but I mean, in the penitentiary world. A four-year sentence was, for what? Child support? Yeah, for not paying, not paying some bitch 50 bucks a week. Yeah, yeah. I didn't pay some chick. Well, that don't make sense. If you're in there, you can't pay any child support. because That's kind of what I said. And the, that's listen, backwards. the guy in front of me, the guy in front of me raped and sodomized a 13-year-old boy, and they gave him two years. 
I'd never been to jail in my life, and I didn't pay some chick 50 bucks a week, and they gave me four years. So I said, so what you're telling me is you'd rather me fuck them than not pay for them? I don't, I don't understand what you're trying to say here, lady. Two years for sodomy on a 13-year-old boy, four years for not paying some chick 50 bucks a week for a child. Crocker shit. Let man. me ask you a little bit about this. We're supposed to be talking wrestling, but oh yeah, we, yeah, we, are, we, 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 we got off. We got off on this other subject. Yes, you ever see any bad fights in prison? Uh, no, no, because it's not, it's not, it's not like it used to be. I don't guess because I didn't, I didn't see it. But I mean, you know, I'm a funny dude. I keep everybody laughing. When I left the jail, they have many jails. They have said to me, Mister Dundee, man. We're gonna miss would you like you, to bro. stay? Would Would you like to stay longer? Did he ever? Oh say yeah, that? much longer. Oh yeah, yeah. If they would let me fuck once a week, I'd never leave ever. You ain't got to pay no bills. You ain't got to do nothing. You can sit around. You can smoke weed. You can smoke cigarettes. You play cards with your buddies. You get fed three meals. I mean, it's great. I mean, so I, I wouldn't leave. I would never leave because I'm a lazy ass redneck dude, and I don't give a fuck. And I got twenty five dollars yeah. a day. I can change the TV, watch what I want to watch. It's my world. Well, it is. Okay, what year did you actually start wrestling? I started wrestling in uh, 1987, 86. I managed first, so it was 87. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, 1980, my dad was the booker for uh, for uh, Knoxville. Remember, Continental had split, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Fuller, uh, Ron Fuller had opened up Knoxville, and my dad was the booker. And mm -hmm. So that was eighty-seven. I started managing Bill and the RPMs in eighty-seven. So yeah. Okay. So when did you get with with your old buddy there, Warren Wolf? Wolf. I got with Whoopi in nineteen ninety-three as PG thirteen. But I did the little run with uh, where I was a heel manager against Bill in 90, 89, 90, and ninety-one in Memphis, where I brought Stone Cold in, and I brought the White Boy in, and I brought Doug Gilbert in. I brought everybody in to beat Bill up, you know, Gaylord and all these dudes <laughs> just to beat Bill up. Because, you know, because everybody knew that I was really a, a rambunctious, wild little child anyway. Because, you know, when you're four years old and wrestlers give you dollars to fucking go tell other wrestlers to go fuck yourself and uh, pierce your <laughs> ear when you're, they get me drunk. My dad, Tommy, got me drunk when I was four, held ice cubes and pierced my ear. So uh, from that moment on, I, I it was very much so I was going to be an entertainer for sure. And Ricky Morton used to always say, here's $5, go tell Kamala to go fuck himself. Because I spoke Australian and I was a little cross-eyed boy and I'd say, hey, you, go fuck yourself. And they just thought that was great. So that's when I thought I could do this forever. Man. So, and, and 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 you got with Wolfie what year? Ninety three. Me and Wolfie actually started wrestling on the outlaw circuits for Dale Man and for Shelby Adcock and all them against each other. Jamie Dundee versus uh, Wolfie D. But he was the medic back then. And then Chris Champion said, "Y'all should do that rapping gimmick together." And that's mm -hmm. when we put the shorts on and became PG thirteen. When did you go to WWF? Our first time we went to WWF was 1995. How many times you been there? <laughs> We've been there just... two or three times there, pal. Uh, we got the, in 95, we got, we got the, uh, it was the USWA tag type. Everybody, that was when they were bringing one, one guy in every Monday night for Lawler to work with. In Memphis, you know, they were bringing Lex Luger in and Shawn Michaels in. And every, every Monday night, Lawler would beat one of their guys at Memphis. And then he would go to WWF. And so it started, we 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 went there to do Royal Rumble or something. And uh, then we then we started Monday night. They gave us three Monday night Raws, and we beat the job boys twice in a row. And then we wrestled the smoking guns for the titles and put them over. That's when Bill Watts was the booker or the agent, whatever. And he's like, Jamie, these guys are too big, but they're fucking idiots. They don't know how to work. They're tag champs. I can't believe it. But you and y'all got to run this match. So... We did the match with the smoking guns, put them over, and then went on back to Memphis, and that kind of helped get us over in Memphis. So I'm James. So I'm sitting, I'm I'm sitting with Jamie one day, and I said, "Hey, what what's that deal where you showed up late for a pay per view or something, and you <sighs> took and you had some outrageous bill that you wanted them to pay and." And they you did. took a you took a cab or something. Tell yeah, that yeah, story. No Ubers back then. Uh, yeah, it was a it, it was a Monday Night Raw show, and the deal. And Brian Christopher, Jerry Lawler's boy, and his partner, 
I won't mention his name because he's still with us or whatever. But Brian Christopher and his partner and me were all in the car and we drove from Memphis. We did Louisville on a Sunday. Once every blue moon, we had to work Louisville on a Sunday. Okay. So we did Louisville on the Sunday and Monday Night Raw was Monday morning. Or my right? And we're supposed to go and, back to and where was Where was that? That was uh, Monday Night Raw was in Saginaw, Michigan, or something, something to that effect. <laughs> anyway, so mm-hmm. Brian, Brian has flown in this Gambino chick. This chick is part of that mafia family, the Gambinos, and, and she has a thousand hits of ecstasy, a thousand volumes, and a thousand Xanax bars. And you know me, I was I like to party back then. So I'm eating the Xanaxes and the fucking I'm eating the ecstasy and I'm, 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 I'm naked in the Denny's at Elizabethtown, Kentucky. We stopped to get something to eat. I'm butt ass naked sitting in the booth and naked in the Denny's. And we're all just having a good time anyway. And we get back in the car and the police pull us over. Imagine that, huh? The police pull us over and they pull us over because did you say when they pulled you over, did you say again? Did you no, say no. That? I said, I said, look at the fucking lights, man. The lights are badass, <laughs> man. Because you know, I don't know if you, I'm sure you Dutch have never done ecstasy, but ecstasy makes everything happy, it makes everybody smile, and it makes and, and colors and everything just go. Woo, woo, woo. And it's really nice, man. It's really fun. And so I eat the ecstasy, and I'm naked in the Denny's, and we go get in the car and we leave, and the police officer pulls us over, and he says he pulls us over because the chick littered. Well, the chick is part of the Gambino family or whatever. And they own like miles and miles of a highway in New York that so they, they don't fucking litter. And that's what she kept telling this cop, but she wasn't telling him in the good way. She said, look, you fucking little hillbilly motherfucker. I'm going to tell you one more time. I didn't litter. And you're you. And he said, if you say one more hang word, on, I, hang, hang on a minute, Jamie, James, be sure to run. L- listen at your own risk. <laughs> very much so we yeah. we do have that because we had kenny bowling on here one time we yeah, had to put a, we had we yeah we had to put not safe for work and all that kind yeah, of stuff yeah, yeah please uh my, yeah yeah uh, and see once i get telling stories the words uh, the cuss words just flow out but anyway she she <laughs> says you little fucking hillbilly cop she said i'm telling you i didn't litter i own fucking 200 acres uh, 200 miles worth of property uh land or whatever in new york and i sponsor it and I, I didn't litter and he said you say one more word like that lady i'm gonna take you to jail she said you fucking hillbilly he slammed her on the ground throw her in the back of the car car and hauled her ass off to jail so now i'm me and brian christopher and tony Williams. oh damn it were, me and brian, were you naked and, were you naked no, no, I wasn't naked. I, I, I was in my little my little underwear, though. But I was naked in the Denny's. I still don't know where my clothes went. But anyway, <laughs> I still don't know where they are today. But but we anyway, the uh, cop throwed her on the ground, takes her to jail. And so Brian, we're in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. So he turns around and drives the car back to Louisville. Now, I was supposed to fly out Monday Night Raw from Nashville. So he goes back to Louisville trying to figure out how to get this chick out of jail. And during the process of going from Elizabethtown back to Louisville, he kept telling me to shut up. And so I guess he assumed if he would just hand me Xanaxes and volumes that they would kick right in and I'd go right to sleep. Did not happen until the next day, you know, the sleeping part. So he's feeding them to me because Brian didn't do no drugs back then. And so I'm eating them and laughing. And then the next thing that we know is the sun's coming up and he's changed my ticket. And I fly to Louisville and I land in the wrong town. And I'm 240 miles away from Saginaw, Michigan. I'm in I'm in Michigan, but I'm not in the right town in Michigan. So I just ask everybody at the fucking airport, can I smoke pot in your cab? Can I smoke pot in your cab? And finally, old fucking Oxnod said, I beep, I beep, yep, get in, get in. So we get in, I smoke pot all the way to the show. And when we pull up down into the little, you know, you go underneath the building, we pull up yeah. underneath the building. I have an $885 cab bill. And somebody's got to pay it because I don't have no money. So Eight, I say eight hundred and eighty-five dollar cab bill. Yeah, because if you you know a cab is about two two dollars and fifty cents a mile, so times two hundred miles is eight hundred eighty-five bucks. <laughs> uh-huh. And so uh, uh, Jim Ross like, uh, uh, listen, Jamie, uh, we we don't we, we're not gonna pay that. I said, yes, you are, and I got my little contract out, and my little contract said we pay all transportation to and from venue. And he said, well, we rented you a car. I said, well, I didn't fucking get it. I rode in the cab. So go ahead and take care of that, buddy. And zipped my shit up, went on back into my dressing room. And uh, it was Brian Christopher's fault because I wouldn't have ever, I would have just drove back to Nashville myself and flew out at Monday Night Raw. But 
he, he was trying to do the right thing by changing the ticket, but when he gave me all them pills, he shouldn't even put me on the plane. He should have just, I should have just missed it. It'd been better off to miss it than it would have been to show up in the state I was in. So you was in a bad, you were in a bad state. Yeah. I was in Michigan. That's a bad state. <laughs> no, uh, I was, uh, I mean, I was on Xanaxes and, and, and ecstasy and volume like Xanax bars and, I, I woke up on the airplane. They were beating me in the chest with a mag flashlight and had that blood pressure thing on me. And they were like, Mr. Dundee, the plane has been deboarded for 45 minutes. We think you had a heart attack. And I said, I didn't have no fucking heart attack. I'm a wrestler. I took that shit off there and rolled on through the airport to the next plane. And then I landed in the wrong town. And then they, they didn't, they didn't arrest you after that. No, no. They arrested me in WCW one time. That was a great story because I was on Xanaxes and Vimes and the road dog and all them were trying to save me, but it didn't work. What's that story? I never heard this story. Oh, you never heard that? We're working for WCW and uh, uh, Dave Sierra. You know Dave? Dave Sierra? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we're on the plane and he, he gives me some Xanaxes and I eat them. So we're catching the connector plane and we're we're going to the ne- to the connection plane to go to the, you know, to go home. I tell the lady at the desk, look, I'm fixing to lay down. And when in the airports, I always laid on the floor and put my feet up in the seat so I could sleep, you know, comfortably mm-hmm. and wait for the planes. And I tell the woman, listen, when the plane gets here, wake me up, put me and make sure I get on this plane. She says, okay, I lay down. I, I think it's been fucking six hours. It's only been eight minutes. I wake up and the whole place is empty. So I get up and I start, you stupid bitch, you let me miss my flight. I start hammering the chicken. The flight hadn't even got there because it had only been about eight minutes. But I thought it had been hours and hours. So the road dog and Brad Armstrong and Scott Armstrong are at the uh, Starbucks, right? They're come, they're working for WWF or road dog WWF and Scott and Brad are in WCW. So the police come and they pick me up and they put me in handcuffs. So Jesse and Jesse, and they come over and they, they say, hey, man, hold on, man. I said, look, look he, you know, we're wrestlers. He wrestles for WCW. He said, he's got jet lag. He said, we just flew back in from Germany. He said, he's got jet lag. He said, if you just unhandcuff him, we'll take care of him. We'll, uh, we'll take him right over here to Starbucks, get him some coffee. We'll sober him up. So they unhandcuffed me, and I, I got me. my things <laughs> like that. And I say, I say, Jesse, one cop's black, one cop's white. So you know my redneck ass. I say, Jesse, do you know in the war when they w- when the Yankees won the war, they only won one thing, and that was these greasy. And I said the N word, and them cops slammed me on the ground and re-handcuffed me and throw me in the back of that car. And, and I said, What am I under arrest for? And they said, For public intoxication. And listen, Dutch, this is great. They drove me all the way to the airport. I mean, to the jail. All the way to the jail. I'm hammering them. You no count, greasy, num, 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 num. You, if it had been the South, the cop would have just pulled over, beat the fuck out of the guy, and left him in the woods. But I guess they wanted to do their job correctly. So they drove me all the way to the to the damn station, and I'm hammering them all the way there. And we go inside the station, and I blow in the tube, and it goes zero, zero, <laughs> zero. And I go, oh, what's that mean? That means I ain't drunk. You stupid! And I start hammering them. Listen, Dutch, they had to drive me back to the airport, buy me a hotel room, put me in the room because I'd have missed the flight to Nashville and put me on the next connector flight and let me go. And brother, I browbeat them all the way home, all the way back to the to the airport. I browbeat them, called him every they didn't have no stripes. I was telling them, you ain't got no stripes because you're a greasy and and so we uh we just went on about our day and listen, they put me in the hotel room. I remember waking up, they come and woke me up, bought me some breakfast and put me on the next flight to Nashville and sent me home. And uh, I kept telling them, I'm going to sue you. I'm a WCW star. I'm just hammering them. And uh, they they had to let me go because that's zero, zero, zero on the breathalyzer. You need to write a book. I've been trying to, but I want to call mine the son of the superstar. Okay. Yeah, and that'd be a good, good name. That would be a good name. Yeah, the son of the superstar. Okay, when you were in WWE, you was in the Nation of Nation. Domination. Yeah. And we the Rock was, was in that. The Rock was in yeah, that. Yeah, the Rock. Rock was in it after we left. When they busted it up, when they busted it up and made all the gangs. Remember, they made a white gang, a black gang, a Mexican gang. Remember, they split it all up because it had a white, a Mexican, and a black. So you was in number Ron Simmons, Ron Simmons, D'Lo Brown, D'Lo Brown. Who uh, else? Crush, Crush, Savio Vega. Yeah. If Savio Crush, D-Lo, if Savio Crush, D-Lo, me, Wolfie, and uh, uh, what was the little manager's name? 
uh, Clarence Mason. And how did uh, how did Mr. Simmons treat you? He loved me. He loved us. <laughs> he said, he said, damn, oh, y'all ride around doing all that cocaine, got rubber dicks laying around in the van. He said, something wrong with you boys. He said, but it reminds me of me and Butch. <laughs> That's what he said. Me and Butch Reed. He said, we've always had them women riding around doing that cocaine. He said, it just reminds me of me and Butch. He said, but you boys don't care. Y'all don't give a shit. But we yeah. had a great deal. Monday Night Raw. And then we could work anywhere we wanted. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we would work for the Lawler. And then Friday and Saturday, we'd fly to ECW. And then Sunday, some Sundays, we'd fly to Smoky Mountain. So we, man, we were fucking, it was great. We were making money hand over fist, working in five huh. companies. It was great. Oh, y'all did good then. Oh, yeah. Okay, let, James, here's a story. I'm sitting in Puerto Rico one day. Phone rings. Ring, 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 ring. Hello. Dutch. <laughs> Jamie <Yeah>. Dundee, <laughs> what was no your shit. what was your what was your name no when you was doing the JCI's uh, JCI's baby or whatever? JCI's baby. And, and they were looking for a place to go work. That's right. And I said, "Well, and Mike I, Anthony, remember Mike Anthony was coming there. My Tiger Mike Anthony, my brother, he he passed away. Remember he was coming. Yeah. Mike was Anthony. And so we so, were going to come with Mike. So let's let us go to work." So I book Jamie and Wolfie. Uh, so they were going to come down. And I remember I went, I think you guys came in on like a Wednesday or a Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. Like in the middle of the week. You, and you, they and didn't the mayor, have... you and the mayor of Knoxville, old Glenn came and picked us up. Yep. So uh, Mr. Kane, he was with me. So we went to the pick... mayor of Knoxville. That's crazy. No, he is the mayor of Knoxville. I know. Uh, that's nuts. Funny things like guys we used to work with doing all this stuff. And I'm thinking, how did, are we in the matrix or what? I mean, yes. Yeah, right. if mayor? someone had, if we didn't went to sleep for 20 years and woke up and they said, Oh yeah, yeah. Kane's the mayor of Knoxville. What, yeah, yeah. what, what? the what? hell? Are you kidding me? Wow. Donald I mean, Trump's Donald Trump's was a president. The Get president, the right. shit out yeah. of here. Are you fucking serious? So I go and pick Jamie and Wolfie up. And y'all go to my place. Oh, you go to my place. Yeah. And yeah. he, I think you was on a bunch of pills that day because you were talking 900 miles a minute. Dutch, it was not pills in Puerto Rico. It's cocaine in Puerto Rico. Puerto well, Rico you, wait a minute. You, cocaine. you had just landed. Oh, but I brought my own. <laughs> oh, okay. That, that's <laughs> go nowhere so, without cocaine back then. I didn't never go brother, nowhere with it. And he starts talking. I swear to God, he talked for 30 minutes straight. And and Jamie, remember, 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 you told me you went to Mexico, yeah, and you and you got a, a like a draw, yeah, and you yeah, could get yeah. it mon money, and they give you something like four thousand or five five thousand pesos, and you thought yeah, that yeah. was so yeah, much the money. Stack of money was that big, man. I thought I was rich. It was like eighteen dollars, <laughs> eighteen American dollars. Looking 150,000 pesos or something. I'm like, oh shit, man. Can't even carry it all. It's so much. And it's about 18 bucks. <laughs> Some shit like that. So I forgot this is this is like a month later. And you had you guys had a match on TV. And I thought the guys that you guys weren't vicious enough or took yeah, over uh, enough. And I said, uh, you said so guys didn't didn't, good yeah. And I said, you guys got to go out there and stay on top of them. Because we're going to work with Mike Anthony and Doby, the champs. So we got to get yeah. out there. So and, uh, yeah, go out there out. and get yourself over. So what happened to Wolfie that day? He was drunk anyway, wasn't he? Yeah, he got super, super drunk. And but he, <laughs> but he said in his in his defense, he said to everybody in the dressing room, "This is what I'm going to do. Should I put Ben Gay in his eye, or should I just?" Take a knife or some shit. He had three choices, and everybody thought Ben Gay was the best choice. <laughs> so, so he so, put Ben Gay in his fingers, and he went to the ring. I had him for. I had him against these two guys who I'd had him against the week before. And said, "But well, they didn't and, sell for us." And yeah, they didn't sell worth the shit. And I may have said, "Well, you got to get them to sell." So he oh. he went and got a handful of Ben Gay, and put it on oh. his hands. And went to the ring and they got in there they locked up eye. and Wolfie bared it in the guy's eyes 
Oh, and I'm watching back. I'm he going out big, there. Big, he was a big guy, oh, Armandito Santiago. He was a big man. <laughs> you still remember his name? Well, Armandito right. I Santiago. I almost got killed over the deal. They came to my room the next morning beating on the door in cop outfits. I remember him forever. <laughs> so anyway, when it happened, Woofy came back and I went, what the f- F did you do? He said, well, man. <laughs> I was trying to get him to sell. I said, did you put Ben Gay in his eye? I think he said, oh, was that what it was or something? I forgot yeah, what yeah, he, he said was, now. And, and Armadito went to the uh, the baby faces dressing room and he was, he got his gun because he was a cop. And he said, I killed a wolfie. I killed a wolfie. And remember, then the, all the police came to the building to protect us. Remember? <laughs> and and we're standing in the ring and I see all these riot gear cops come in. And I told Wolfie, I ain't going to jail in this town. I'm not going to jail, Puerto Rico. Fuck this. So as soon as the match is over, I'm going into the bathroom. I'm trying to bust the window out. I'm going out the window or whatever. I'm not going to prison at the Big Bear in Puerto Rico. That shit is not happening. So and, uh, to tell this story, Jamie, I don't know. You disappeared somewhere. But they right. did come They did come looking for Wolfie about 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, they beat on the hotel door. And he was already gone. They said. And they, he, if they'd have got words. him, they'd have hurt him. Yeah. Or they'd have killed him. He said. Amigo Ice, you fight with honor. You protect your partner. You fight like a man, but you're part of something in my eye, and I come to kill the wolfie. And I said, well, <laughs> wolfie ain't here, brother. And I said, he's having notes. He's gone on the airplane. He, he, he paid $1,750 to leave today and flew his ass back to America. And, and he like, went well, to the airport and slept at the airport all night, right? And flew, flew out right then, paid $1,750. Bucks. That girl sent him the money, and he flew out right then, that that. That, that girl that he, he flew in there, remember? And she flew him, sent him the money, 1750 bucks for a one-way ticket from Puerto Rico, from San Juan to Nashville. So if anybody mm. needs to know, you can get one for $1,750 one way. <laughs> at the spur of the drop of a hat. So what was happened that night was in the stadium show. Yep. And you guys were leaving, and all of a sudden the people started chasing you. Well, and yeah, chased you. You didn't run to the dugout where you should should have run. You no, ran we the going long to the dugout, and they were all. You know how they stood on top of the dugout and they threw rocks and piss <laughs> and all dynamite or whatever the hell they had. I don't even know where these little savages got all this shit. But anyway, they would throw it at you. So uh, I, me and Wolfie's gonna go in the dugout. They're all standing on top, and I said, "Man, we was a main event, right?" So everybody's fixing to leave anyway. I said. Where does that go? Well, he said, there's a gate down there. I said, well, let's go that way. So we <laughs> took off running down through Bayamon Baseball Stadium in a full sprint. And I just remember the police came running behind us because to protect us. And uh, every person in the stand came running behind them. And I said, well, if you, if you fall, you're dead, bro, because they're going to kick the shit out of us. And we ran all the way down around outside the thing through the parking lot, all the way around the building back in the front door. But so I'm sitting in, James, I'm sitting in the dugout and I see this. I said, where in the elf are them two bastards <laughs> going? <laughs> where are they going? So I'm sitting there, know. sitting there. And all of a sudden I heard this big commotion back in the dressing room. And I go up there and there's Jamie and Wolfie standing there. They had went all the way around the long way and come now, back in where the fans out, get, the where the fans, yeah, yeah. And they come in the, the dressing room door. I said, how in the hell did y'all get here? And they said, well, they were chasing us and we went Ran, around and baby. remember y'all had those hubcaps that couldn't knock yeah, it yeah. out. Couldn't knock the that, frog out. We, yeah. We, yeah. We, we put them over our head when they throw that shit at you to go. But I mean, there was, we did the, we did the screw on Mike at the, at that stadium there. We did the, we did the gimmick on Mike. And so then people was hot, man. And they were, I mean, they were the whole crowd was on that stand. I was like, shit, man, I'm not letting all them people throw something at me, man. I said, let's go. We we it, it worked out well, but it could have been a bad scene because if that door down there wouldn't have opened, or <laughs> it could have been a bad day, man. Because they were crazy. Remember you, they bur- they burn up cars no sh- and all kind of shit. Oh yeah, they set one guy's car on fire. Some spot show there. Yeah, what was that? So, he, uh, Bronco El Bronco. They said El Bronco. Because of, well, yeah. because he was talking about a bunch of Haitians that lived there or something. Yeah, yeah. And they, they didn't this like man's him. car over and caught it on fire, man. Yeah, they turned it over and set it on fire. So he went to the town with the car and came. It was towed back and was already burnt yeah. up. Barbecue Crazy. Chris. What well, was it? Was working, invader, he was working with Invader too, right? So yeah, talking about the Haitians, right? What was the story? Because I'm sure Dutch has told me. What was the story with the WrestleMania payoff? 
the the, the hundred dollar payoff is, when you go to WrestleMania, you got to go a week early. Everybody, when you do WrestleMania, they fly you in. If WrestleMania was on March the seventeenth, you flew in on March the tenth, and yep. you're in town all week. And they make you take draws. They give you money while you're there and make you take the draws. So really, they paid us a hundred dollars, but we had already drawn up all our money from the week from the week we were there. You see what I'm saying? All they owed us was a hundred dollars. So therefore, we got a hundred dollar payoff for WrestleMania. But really, we had got whatever the hell it was, fourteen hundred or whatever it was for the week. Because I think I, I think ours was fifteen hundred. I don't know what it was. I don't remember as many years ago. I got the check stub somewhere. But but it was it was uh they they had already gave us the money for the week. But we didn't look at it like that because we didn't ask to be there for the week. They made us be there, so we thought that money was just fucking free money. So we thought we were still going to get paid for WrestleMania and bonus or something. And we got a hundred dollar check, but it was because we'd already been fired and we were sitting at home. And if I didn't need a hundred dollars, I would have sent the some bitch back. But I called Wolfie and I said, how many zeros on your check? <laughs> he said, two. I said, there's two on mine too. And something's not right. Cause you know, Tracy Smothers sat in the hotel room. Freddie Joe Floyd sat in the hotel room and they paid him $1,500. And we fucking were semi-main event with the against the Road Warriors, a street fight, taking bumps and fucking just being pounded. And we made a hundred dollars. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, we really we made our guarantee because our guarantee was a certain amount of money, and then we could wrestle anywhere else we wanted. And just so happened that WrestleMania, we drew it all up. We didn't know we were drawing it up. They just come every three days or two days and hand us three or four hundred dollars. And so. Ninety days later, when the checks come out and from the pay per view, we so, got a hundred dollars. So when they came up and handed you three or four hundred dollars, I bet you thought, "Wow, this is nice." Oh yeah, this is they, nice. They, I like they this. Just, they just giving us. They just giving us money. Yeah, free catering. We get to eat some fucking dry ass chicken and shit. We didn't even, didn't even get none of Jr's barbecue sauce. You cheap some bitch. No, we didn't get none of that. But but uh, we smoked dry ass chicken and some terrible fucking noodles from somewhere. And, and we ate that for a whole week and they gave us like $300. And I thought, wow, well, that's awful nice. But, you know, we did we did appearances and stuff. So I kind of thought it was for the appearances because, you know, my time ain't you free. Know, it ain't cheap. A, a lot of people don't understand that. But the week before WrestleMania, you oh, work your ass off. Ass off. You are not wrong. You're making three or four appearances a day. day sell, every day selling, in that town. Selling gimmicks out the ass. Yeah, and they, 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 I mean, literally, they got you somewhere till noon, and then it, then you got like a forty-five minute window to get to the next place, and then then you're there for two hours there, and then you got another hour it's every all day, every day, and then finally when WrestleMania comes, you're so fucking tired, you just want to go to the ring and go back to bed. The after party sucks, <laughs> and everybody's so tired and wore out. Okay, let's go back to the uh, uh, what's his name, Santiago. Oh yeah, I'm a detail Santiago. Okay, remember, Woofy was you. You guys got the ring right before he put that in his eye. Yeah. Woofy went to punch the guy, and, and the up. guy couldn't even see. Yeah, and he swung a punch, and the guy didn't even see it. He was just settling in the eye, and he pulled back. Woofy yeah. completely missed him missed. and went down. Yeah, and then he got a hold of Wolfie, and that's when I ran and kicked him in the head and hit him with the cat. That's why he said to me the next day, Amigo, you fight with honor. You protect your partner as you should. <laughs> and I thought, I'm fucking glad. <laughs> I'm so glad he called that honor. <laughs> I'm so whatever it was. Uh, but, I mean, because that dude was a big dude, man. That dude was 300 pounds. Yeah. But you, didn't, and, you, you know, didn't give a you didn't give a crap, did you? No, but I, I mean, I just thought, well, I mean, you know, Wolfie didn't do well here, so I better help get this guy off him. And then when we got, you know, then we go back to the dressing room, and 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 then it's like, what the fuck did you do? I, I, and then and do do you remember the very next day when Invader says, "Amigo, can I see you? Can I talk to you in my office?" I <laughs> told so Mike Anthony, "I ain't going." <laughs> said, yeah, I said, no, not. I said, I'm not going, man. He goes, "Come on, I'll go with you." I go, okay. "You and five others, come on, let's all go." So we go in there, and that's when he started telling me about Frank, about Brody, about the things that happened on the island. And he starts crying. He tells me about his son. And he, I'm like, wow, I didn't fucking sign up for none of this, bro. I didn't sign up for none of this right here. And Why was he, like, oh. You know, for the people that don't know, this was after Bruiser Brody's death. 
Yeah. Why yeah, was he? Yeah. Why was he telling you all this stuff? Well, he called me in there to talk to me. Uh, what your partner did, and me go very, very crazy move. You know, lots of things happen on the island, and you know, and then he starts going into his son passed away. Somebody, his son was murdered or something. Is that correct? No, his daughter was a baby. She's about three months old. She died. Okay. Well, it's, okay. And then somebody, and then, then for, he said, my daughter died. And then, for, then the Brody incident happens. And then he said, many, many things happen on this Island. Your, your partner's a very, very crazy man for doing that. And I'm like, look, bro, I don't know nothing about it. Didn't know nothing about it. I said, matter of fact, that was him and Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Dutch about it. I don't well, know. Bro. I'm glad. I, Wait a minute. Could I see you with my eye? I, I, I spy with my little eye. No, yeah, yeah, you can see. You can see. Joe Don Smith can see for you. So uh, so he called you in there and told you all this stuff. Anything yeah. happened? He just started crying? Well, I mean, he, 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 he just said that, and then he passes. Now, me this, was about, this is about at least five, six years after the Brody. Incident. Yeah, right. And so then, and then he hands me and Mike a beer, and we start drinking a beer. We're just sitting in that office, and he's just talking. He's just, uh, I guess he's venting. He don't have, I don't know if he... I don't know why he picked us, but he didn't have nobody to vent to or something. I don't know. He just, it was a friendly conversation. He was telling me I did fine. And that's when, the, remember, I did the backdrop on the field. And he's like, yeah, backdrop every night, amigo, show stealer. Yeah. And he was putting me and Mike over. But, I mean, it was really, really weird. I was like, well, this is weird shit, man. I just, I, I was like, oh, I don't know. Where's Dutch at? Where, where, where's, where's Lord Humongous? <laughs> don't look, don't look for me. Yeah, he's after eating mosquitoes, was, fucking uh, canes, <laughs> eat mosquitoes, and fucking dugs. Uh, Dutch is fucking gone, and dude's crying and shit. I'm like, Wolfie flew off the island. I, I threw up my door. I'm like, I ain't even had no cocaine by then. I still didn't get none of that good cocaine yet. I was ready to go home, but after that, it was fine, fine. Okay, so you did cocaine while you were in Puerto Rico? Um, no. <laughs> you did Of course. Of course. It's only $1,200 a kilo. It's twenty five thousand really? a kilo in America back then. It was twenty five thousand dollars a kilo in America back then, and it was twelve hundred dollars in Puerto Rico, and it was pure. It was good. So how would, so how much would you get it at a time? As much as I could get, because see, I mean, for fifty fucking dollars, you would get what cost you five hundred in ten in Tennessee, and it was good shit. Me and Brian Lee, me and Brian Lee, I bet we walked seven thousand miles. Fucking snorting bumps up and down the beach. My feet, fucking feet hurt so bad because, you know, for people who don't know, first time you get on the beach, this little bitty sand is little bitty rocks. And when you're used to being in Nashville, Tennessee all the time and you go to the fucking beach and you're barefooted and you snort cocaine, you walk up and down that beach for days, bottom of your feet really hurt, man, because it peels the skin off and all that. It kind of sucked. You know, Lord, James, I, did, I didn't know this would be such an educational interview. <laughs> oh, very educational interview. And for those who've ever been to jail or want to do cocaine or walk up down the beach, I'll tell you the goods and the bad. The right and the well, wrong. Everybody that I mentioned your name to, they all got a Jamie story. And so I, none of them. I remember. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. No, James, no, you, no. You, you got any questions that you want to ask Jamie? Yeah, I've got a ton. Just normal, normal questions. I've got, hey, I've listen, got, Robert Redford even said, Robert Redford even said, welcome back, Mr. Dundee. I believe we missed you. Hey, a big Bob <laughs> said that about me, baby. <laughs> I've got a million me questions for you. I mean, how many do you want? Come I'll give on. him a how few. How long you got? How long you should show? Well, I'll tell you, as long as it needs to be. Um, I want to ask you now, because how's your dad doing? Uh, as far as Bill, he's, he don't know it, but he's all right. I mean, he, he's uh, he's got that dementia. He don't. He don't. He, he this this is him. This is him right here. He just smiles all the time like that. He just sits around smiling. I'm like, Fuck, where you at, man? Where you at? What's the, what are you smiling about? What's you happy for? But uh, they say in dementia that, that once you get to stage three and then stage four, which is the the end there. But stage three, they say once you get there, you either cry all the time or you smile all the time, and then that's what he does. So I'm glad he don't just sit around crying all the time. That would fucking suck. Yeah, absolutely. Where's yeah, he living? Um, yeah, with that that lady in uh, uh up by Memphis somewhere. I don't know. I, I haven't seen him since uh the last show we did with Jeff and Wolfie and me and him uh, about a year and a half ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I, I I called him a few times, but he he don't even he don't know it. So he told Crazy Gail uh, the other day. He said Crazy Gail, and she said. Uh, I'm going to call Jamie. He said, I just saw him a week ago. So it's been a year and four months or something, and he thinks it's a week ago. So that's cool. 
But physically, he's okay right now, you think? Uh, he sleeps a how, lot, they say. How old like is he? He's 80, he's 80 next month. October, and this month, actually, October 24th, he'll be 80. I'm going to go see him on his birthday if, he, you know, if he's still around. Well, tell, him, tell him I said hello. I tell tell him. he won't be, remember? Well, good, then tell him James said hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, he don't even know James, so he said, oh, okay, mate. Speaking of, speaking of like, like, like uh, all the wrestlers that have passed away this year, you know what I mean? Like the Iron Sheik, uh -huh. Jerry Jarrett, the Bushwhacker, fucking, uh, there's a bunch of big, big names. They, they quit telling Bill, like, Jerry Jarrett passed because it, it makes him sad for a second that he forgets and then he'll mention it. And then it, it's like they got to just, like, Groundhog Day, they got to keep telling him over and over. Mm -hmm. So they just quit telling him anything like that. They quit telling him anything about wrestling. Because, you know, I guess it, it probably hurts him as much as it, it makes him smile. It makes him sad, too, I would think. And he has to relive it over and over again. So they just quit telling him anything. He don't did even have a to telephone or nothing. Did you go to Jerry Jarrett's funeral? No, sir. I can't do funerals. I didn't go to Brian Christopher's okay. funeral. I don't do funerals no more. I did way too many throughout my life, and I'm not doing no more. Well, let me ask you this. Did anything ever materialize or, 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 or come to – hang on a minute. Wait a minute. That's Vince. Can't talk to you, Vince, doing a podcast. Yeah, tell him we're busy. Jamie Dundee. Yeah, tell him to call JR. Like Jack. Tell him to answer on the right side of his head. If he answers on the left side, he won't be able to hear you. You are too much, man. <laughs> I'm not laughing at it. Jamie, don't laugh. Oh, don't don't laugh. laugh. We're not laughing because that, that is a terrible thing, but I'm glad it got that motherfucker. That's karma. Boy, this is, I can see the news now. I can see the highlights. Oh. Jamie Dundee, air. I told you, ninety thousand people there. Y'all are down to like six thousand now. Jamie Dundee <laughs> hates hates the Jim oh, yeah. Ross. Yeah, I, I hate I Jim Ross, but that don't matter. I, I but I, I people that have Bell palsy, I'm not making fun of that disease. I promise, I'm not. I hate it for you. I think it's terrible. I wish everybody could just give it to Jim Ross. That way, his whole face would just be like at all times. Oh. <laughs> you know that how much editing? Tackle. You know how much editing we're going to have to do on this show? None, because the show's called The Truth. It is what it is. Is that what it's called, James? Yeah, the truth. It is what it is. The truth. All right, you got another question for Jamie. Sure. I've got, yeah, do you know what? I've got a question for both of you because you brought up Bobby Eaton's name at the beginning and it's someone oh, who we that's don't... My brother you know what? We just don't talk about Bobby Eaton a lot on the show and we really should. So any stories you've got of Bobby, we'll hear them all. In fact, and, and just before, did you ever meet George Goulas? Me? Yeah. Oh, my God. George, I just saw George last month. You George. Or last year. No, he was at that show. It was me, my dad, Jeff Jarrett, George Goulas, Tony Falk, uh, LT Falk, Doug Gilbert, and uh, 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 where well, I got a poster for it. Let me see who else was there. I got the poster on the wall right here. And George, and George was, Goulas was there. What was he doing? Selling pictures and signing autographs. That's <laughs> where he, he was. Did he sell many? Yeah, was he giving them away know. for free? It's yeah, I, I, you know me, I, I'm fashioned to be late everywhere I go. So by the time I got there, I just got shit whisked to the table. I signed a bunch of shit, went to the ring, and went home. Okay, okay I'm going to ask you a question. Is me George Goulas <laughs> you? Oh, okay. Is George Goulas one of the top three worst wrestlers you've ever seen? And we'll see, here's the thing. I don't know because I was only four, five, and six when he wrestled. So I just hear a story. I've never seen George Goulas wrestle. Uh, I know that, that the Jarrett stole the company from his dad. I know that part because I was no, a little boy. No, he didn't. Uh, they didn't? Well, I didn't know. No. I just know what I hear. You no, were they, working for the Poffos in ICP or whatever it was called. I, back never, then, so. I never worked for the Poffos. Well, son of a bitch, I got a program in here that says you did. I may have been down, but I didn't make the show. You know, I'm show, you show I'm, 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 I've done a lot of those. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. Jerry Jarrett, let's set the record you straight. Worked, Jerry you Jer worked with Randy and, and uh, Angelo and the freaking Leaper. What's his name? Lenny. He just died too, didn't he? He died this year. Yeah. He, no, he, yeah, he did die this year. Yeah. yeah no, but did. I never, I never, I never worked for Randy. Oh, well, I, I, may, I, I may have done a shot. That yeah, I because that, like I got the programs I got, Miss Delphia had them, you know, from Louisville. Yeah. And there is some a bunch of those ICP, Elemental P, whatever they were called. And Dutch Mantel, you were a big draw on them because you're the main event against Randy or against uh, Angelo or against Randy. 
Uh, I mean, uh, on, on a bunch of them I had, but I sold them to that guy, so I can't let, bust them out right let, now. Well, let me ask you. How do you know you got that dementia? <laughs> <laughs> because I damn sure don't remember doing that. Stuff. Well, well, but well, wait a minute. Let, let me let me rephrase it. Maybe 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 it was you working with Tojo and them when they did the split. Would that be right? Did you go with Jared or did you go with the Goulas? No, I went with Jared. Doing right, the split. so it is. I guarantee it's it's you in the ICW. A bunch of them. Good I, I got. But well, you need to copy. You need to copy some of them, and I'll tell you if I've ever been in those towns for Randy. I will be because it was you. It's you and uh, Tony Falk was on the shows. You were the barroom brawlers. What's his name? Jeff uh, Sward and uh, what's his name? And and Leaping Lanny and uh, 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 Randy Poffo and Angelo. What was Angelo oh, Miser? Yeah, I, and that's that's an app name for Angelo to have the Miser. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but I was with. Uh, I was working for. Nick Goulas, and then that's when the split came. Split. That was 77, right? 78? Something like that. Hell, yeah. years ago. And I, I just remember one thing that, that Jerry Jarrett told me. He says, make sure that you tell Nick Goulas that you're leaving. You don't have to tell him you're going with me. Just tell him that you're leaving. You're finishing up. That's well, that's a that's a legal thing, I guess. I don't know. I guess it makes it uh, makes you. Uh, you well, it's not that out. I just didn't. I just didn't leave without a notice. Right. It's what it was. So, but then he. Hey, then listen. He's, I need to know a story about you and my dad working with the Fantastics in the penitentiary because I kind of read it in that Wow book. But wasn't it you I, and Bill against? Yeah, the Fantastics? I, I just I just talked about that the last podcast we did with Bobby, uh, right, James? Um, yeah, who's our last guest? I've got dementia now. Was oh, Bobby was ago? your last guest? Oh, no, uh, awesome. Bobby Fulton. Bobby Fulton. Yeah, Bobby yeah, Fulton. Yeah. That's what I mean. It was his birthday just yesterday or the day before that or something. Yeah, we we went to this prison and you know, maximum security. It was LaGrange Penitentiary. In LaGrange, <laughs> why, does everybody know, why does everybody know that? Where that place is. Is that a famous prison in Kentucky? Uh, well, I mean, if you're in Kentucky, it's the big one. It's the big one. It's the only one that, that it's the only one that counts. If you go there, you get credibility. You go to any other any of the other ones, you don't get credibility for being an inmate. Brother, I could not wait to get outside that gate. <laughs> <laughs> My they sit, God. They, they love them fantastic though. Weren't they in the little skippy shorts oh, and shit? Oh they, yeah. What? They they love Tommy Rogers. Yeah, hell yeah. Because I told they everybody to leave that, him with me, baby. That leave the him baby with me that the baby faces were the heels and the yeah. heels were the baby yeah. faces. Fuck yeah, because that's the prison. And I, right? and I got him at a stretch and I reached down and I pulled his trunks up to oh show my God. like one of his cheeks of his little, little oh, butt. Shit. And they oh, said, hell. throw him out of here, Dutch man. Yeah. We know yeah. what to do with him. And Tommy got pissed off like a son. Hell yeah. And he I said, screw this do. man. Screw this. I'm, I'm going leaving. Home, I, said, I said, well, leave. I'm not stopping you. I said, yeah, but the door's right back there. Go on. Oh, yeah, I had one little rope, didn't you? One little rope around you, around the ring. We didn't even have that security. Yes, yeah, like no, the rope. Just, it, no? no, wasn't anything. Not, they, not that I remember. And I'm chairs. looking out there, and they any what chairs? No, they don't. Just they chairs. And gym, no, no chairs. The guards, brother. The guards you can't. Up top. Yeah. You can't put chairs down there, pick up and beat the shit out of everybody. Yeah, yeah, sure enough, sure enough. What am so, I thinking? And they were just standing around, and I always remember, here's your white nationalist Aryan guys. They're standing yeah, over that's there. Right. They're all together. All the black guys are together. Yeah, all, all together. The, that's right. All the that's Hispanic right. guys are together. They're off in corners. That's right. That's what that's that's and what then, Vince saw when he made the nation you, of domination. Th then your then your gay people, they were all together, brother. And I'm looking up. I didn't see one guard. Actually, I didn't, even see, I didn't even see my out. trustee that, that they that was, sent, you know. He was yeah, hit out somewhere. Yeah. Hell, he was all, they were all, anyway, I could not wait to get off that floor. I'm thinking, you know, if they have a damn riot, yeah, you're who, you're we're fucked. screwed. We're, we are literally screwed. Didn't they run it every year for like four or five years or something? The they, only ran it, they only ran it one with me. Oh right, I, right, right. They they mentioned it the the year after. I said, yeah, I don't know if I want to go to Lagrange, Kentucky. So LaGrange, I canceled. I, I canceled out before they put me in it. So, 
It was right, right. I remember something Jamie, about my dad. You never you never I'm made sorry. it. You never made the prison show. No, not the show. I made it to the prison. <laughs> <laughs> I went to LaGrange, but no, I didn't make the hey, show. What? I, hey, I this would there. be a great deal. This would be a great deal. Yeah. You just get out of the prison. <laughs> yeah. Then the week after, you're actually wrestling there. Wrestling back here. Fuck you. We're booking. We're running. On the show, and you're waving to all your buddies and all this Oh, yeah, kind of yeah. Stuff. All my cellmates. Hey. What, what a great story that would be. You need to write a book. Call it hey, the when truth. I did the Jerry Springer show, I did when it, uh, one of the shows I did was called when it James, you know what that you know what the you know what the Jerry you, you know what the Jerry Springer oh, show dude. is. Jerry Springer was so big here as well, man. Too hot <laughs> for TV. Hey, do you oh. know that uh, I flew to England when Jerry Springer did a white supremacist show because of my redneck voice? They flew, they paid for everything and flew us to England. And no, we did, we did a five day thing. It was great. It was like in 1996, 95. How worked uh, is did, it? How worked is Jerry Springer? Do they have anyone genuine on? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is how Jerry Springer works. You know, he just he just died too, man. Mm-hmm. But you know, uh, this is how Jerry Springer went. If you picked up the telephone and you called the studio, you got fifty bucks and stayed at the fucking Super Eight Hotel and you told your story. If they picked this story and called you like they did me, like the Iron Sheet gave them my number because they needed midgets. That's how I got involved with them. They they want I owned a midget. <laughs> they needed a what? They they want they wanted midgets. I needed they needed midgets, and you know I owned that little one midget of mine, Danny. That was, I owned him for like seven years. So yeah. so when, when when they called me to get midgets, that's how it all began. But but they flew us. To, I went to the Bahamas with them. I went to England with them. I got to, they flew me all over the world, and fucking they want you to spend as much money as you can because they got to write that off on taxes. It was great. I loved it. What did they fly you to the Bahamas for? To do a show about midgets. Uh, no, no, no. The my midget show was uh, called Invasion of the Little People. They needed a hundred midgets, so the Iron Sheet gave them my phone number. I found thirty. I took thirty midgets through the Nashville airport, flew to Chicago with fucking Oompa Loompas. Oompa Loompa Oompa Dee Doo. I had them do that all the way through the airport, and it was great. Man, you should see thirty midgets on the plane. The people are tripping out, man. They were like, "Oh my God, there's thirty midgets on this plane." Where, where else did you go with Jerry Springer? Uh, I went to the Bahamas and went to England and I went to everywhere, all, every, all the states. Cause like they would call me on a Sunday night that I was their go-to man. Sunday night, Jamie, we need a, a, a fat black transvestite midget to join the clan. I say, I'll find him. And I'd hang up. I'd get on that phone. I start calling all the wrestlers we know and just start and find, by God, I'd find that son of a bitch. And sure enough, here we go. <laughs> Monday morning, we're on the airplane. Here I come with a fat black one-legged midget to join the clan. Here we go. And by God, we land in Chicago. And sure enough, after we fucking land in Chicago, they pay me $500 per show. And I take three shows sometimes and get paid 1500 bucks on Monday, be back home Tuesday morning with $1,500 in my pocket, didn't have to do nothing else. Then they call me next Sunday. This, this is what is we the need. First, this is the first time I've ever heard anything about this. Oh, really? I did yeah. 13 shows. I did. Thir- I took Bill on there. I took my mom on there. Is I took it a- everybody. Is it online? Yeah. Type in uh, the Dundees on Jerry Springer. You can watch it. Uh, hell yeah. I, I, did, remember I, did. Cu- I remember a couple of them. Okay. Steve, Steve Wilkos, you know, the cop guy. Yeah, I did yeah. the pilot episode for him called Steve to the rescue for him to get his own television show. I did the pilot episode because he knew how believable and real it was going to be. They they flew down. They they paid my mom five grand to rent her house. They give her twenty five hundred to be on it. They give it was they rented the limos from Bill. Gave him fifteen thousand for the limos for a week. It was great. I mean, I, I was big time in there with them. I was booking that shit more or less. They would call me and say, "This is what we want," and I would go find it. Fuck the wrestling business. I'm Jerry Springer, baby, all day long. What What else did you suggest to these people? Anything. The very first show I ever did, I was pimping my wife's 14-year-old sister. They, they called me up and they're like, Jamie, we you don't got just call. Uh, you don't give a shit, do you? No, not a flying fuck. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, they picked the phone up and they called me and they said, look, Jamie, this guy just called the show and he's pimping his wife's 14-year-old sister. Said, that son of a bitch is crazy. Will you play the part? I said, hell yeah, I played because they said with your redneck voice, that fits perfect. So they flew to Nashville. I went to the hood, rented the crack house, got four or five crack dudes and set them around the crack house and sat in there and made it look like I was selling my wife's 14 year old sister. And then Steve comes in the house and he, you know, big Steve to the rescue and he saves the day and he tries to get the girl off the street and all that shit. It was great. 
Oh, wait, I gotta I see. I gotta. I gotta see. I gotta see that. Hey, how oh, many, yeah, how many different on. names? How many different names did you have on the Jerry Springer show? Because you no, played like every. No. Yeah, I'm Jamie. Just Jamie. They don't say no last names anyway, so it's just Jamie. But everybody was, knew. How Bill was, was our Bill. Bill came on it on that pimp show. Bill comes out there and tells me what you're doing is not right. You gotta quit pimping, little girls, and yeah, because it had a 15 minute segment. And it got such big ratings, they gave me a whole hour. So I had the next show, I just had a whole hour of me pimping every little girl that was in the school. I tell you, you know, it's the first time I started out, I was pimping the girl because we needed the money and she was going to give it away anyway, Jerry. So why not charge 5 or $10 to get some food to feed the family? You know, I was humble. I was doing it just because. But by the second show, I'm, shit, I'm buying that little whore Barbie dolls and One Direction tickets, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's great. Great. I'm going to look that up. So, oh yeah, you got to look them up. It's the Dundee's. It's listed yeah, under just, like the Dundee's and uh, Dundee's. Well, if, and Jerry if you Springer. go to Jerry Springer, you, like you can go to Jerry Springer has like a page where you can watch all the episodes. It's called one of them's the one of them's I'm a 14 year old hooker. That's the name of the one where I'm pimping the little girl, and then the other one's called a midget militia where I got a hundred. Listen, I got a hundred midgets that bow down to me and rob banks and rape and pillage and plunder and bring me all the stuff, and I'm their ruler. I'm the leader. I, they flew us to Virginia, and there was a bunch of little hunting cabins, and they made it look like all the midgets lived in these hunting cabins, and I lived in the big cabin, which was actually the where everybody met, ate breakfast and stuff before the hunt, but they made it look like like I lived in that and all these little midgets would come and they would hand me like gold and trinkets and jewelry. And I would kick them down the hill and I was their leader and their ruler. And Jerry was telling me, I, you're not treating them like human beings. I'm like, they're not human beings. They're fucking midgets. <laughs> they don't count. <laughs> they're, they're, they don't, they don't have no say in this world, Jerry. Oh, I love James, it. I, I love James, it. did you hear, you ever hear anything about this? I knew, I knew Jamie was on a couple of the springers in the early ones, but I didn't, yeah, yeah, I yeah. didn't, I didn't know you were like booking it basically. Or oh like yeah. You were yeah I, did, I did 13 shows, 13 episodes. I did 13 shows. Nine of them made the air. Because, see, what Jerry did was every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Jerry would do three shows on Monday, three shows on Tuesday, and three shows on Wednesday. That's nine shows a week. And then he would take off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And so them nine shows a week, they would edit them up, and the best five would make the air in 90 days. Because there are 60 days. It took 60 days to edit them up. So that's why they say he's got enough footage, even though he's dead right now, he's got enough footage to run another 20 years and never watch the same show. Hmm. Because he did nine a week and only five made the air. So he put four back in the vault. You see what I'm saying? So he had four put away. How many wrestlers did you have, if any, on these shows? I, I took about four or five uh, outlaw wrestlers. You know, I took a, a guy named Frenchy Riviera. He was a real big fat guy. He got stuck in the window, got caught sneaking out of his brother's house, banging his brother's old lady, coming out the trailer window. He gets hung up in the window, stuck, and he's in the wrestling shit. Uh, the Iron Sheik and uh, uh, the Pitbull, uh, Anthony Durrani, the, uh, they they were the ones that did it first. And then they gave him my number. Madman Pondo did it. Mitch Ryder did it. Uh, tons of uh, – anytime, I would just start calling people, man. I would just start dialing wrestling numbers and find what they wanted. That's why they love me. Because they wow. would just call me a spur of the moment on Sunday night. And Monday morning, we're on an airplane going to Chicago. Everything paid for. Staying at the fucking Hilton High Rise. Spending that money like it's crazy. Was, it's called Jerry Springer money. And it's got Jerry's face on it. You can spend it anywhere in Chicago. And they just turn it back into NBC Studios and they get their money. It's a fucking jack-off and a two-faced prick. And that son of a bitch. Why did you bring him on this show, James? He's going to cause us all kind of problems. Now we're going to get kicked off. Hang on, thank it, you. I think he's frozen. Thank now. you, Jimmy. Yeah, he he ought to be frozen. Where is he? On, Jamie, gonna, you there? I'm going to pause. Bye. I'm losing you. We're out of minutes. Damn it! Ah, right, we lost him. We lost him. That was Damn. fun. How much time was that? One hour twenty-two. Well, we almost got there. Well, he's wide open, isn't he? Mm. He's wide open. At some misses, he, he's not boring. I'm just going to say, so, he, he can um, breathe now. It's been one one hour twenty of not breathing. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, so are we on? Uh, are we live now? Yeah, we can be live now. So we're just sort of uh, we're almost just like breathing now. I was like, oh uh, uh, yeah. Do you know I, what? I'm I just so, realized I'm so am I'm so amped up. 
I can actually go run like a mile right now. <laughs> Do you know, I've just realised I asked one question about Bobby Eaton and then I started talking about George Goulas and we never even got to Bobby Eaton. No, we never did. And Bobby Eaton is a much, much more better subject than George Goulas. Mm. Actually, I've given George Goulas more publicity than he's ever had before. Nobody knew who George Goulas was before. Now they're saying, well... Dutt says he's like one of the worst wrestlers ever. Yeah, I can't believe and, that Jamie said that he was doing autographs. He must have been giving them away. Well, uh, he may have done one or two. Three, I, I don't know how many people they had there. Did he have his family with him? Know. Who, uh, George? Yeah. Give them a couple of autographs, make him feel better. Oh, man, I don't think he has any family, to tell you the truth. Oh, really? His mother's dead, his father's dead, and this is years ago. They've been dead. Oh, they've been dead 30, 40 years, I guess. So, but anyway, but anyway, I enjoyed Jamie. He is one hell of a character to make a trip with because when you make, and you, you got a kind of a taste when he gets on something, he will stay on it and he'll find a, he'll find a spot that touches a, that you like, and he'll keep going back to it. Comedians call it a callback. He does callback, but he's very, very entertaining. Hmm. And I had a lot. He's done so much stuff <clears throat> that I've forgotten about half of it, really. Because he's just Jamie is Jamie. So, and how old did he say he was? 53? Yeah, 52? he kept saying 53, yeah, something like that. Yeah, well, crazy guy. And I do remember him on being on the Springer show, but I am going to look at those lost Springers, especially with Jamie and the little midgets, the little people. I got to see that. <laughs> now I have a burning desire to see Jamie Dundee with about 50 midgets. Worshiping. And him. to see. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. And Jamie, when he's in charge, he, he, ta he takes charge of it. And he's entertaining. I want to, I, and Jamie is not here because <clears throat> he lost his, <clears throat> his power on his phone. But I'd like to thank him for joining us. And we've been trying to get him for like a year. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he would just leave us sitting. But that is the, the risk you take when you book Jamie. He may be there and he may not be there. Hey, do you know, I've got and a confession, when, Dutch. You know, the other times when we thought Jamie might be on and then he wouldn't, I'd always write like a uh, a backup script just in case. Yeah. I didn't write one this time because I knew he, I just knew he'd come on because he kept, he kept like messaging me and yeah. he kept messaging you as well. So I thought, no, he's serious this time. And he was. Well, and he, he actually, I thought he was going to have a lot more, uh, a lot more trouble getting on, but he actually got on. Much, much easier than I thought. Yeah, only took 20, 30 minutes. Like a <laughs> yeah, blink, of, blink of an eye. <laughs> but how much time would it take me sometimes to get on? I think the longest we've taken was 40-odd minutes. <laughs> well, I tried. You was trying something new with me that was unfamiliar, and I was trying to learn it, but it's I kind of got it now. Mm. So... Apart from last week when you couldn't work out which camera was which. You couldn't work out how to switch the cameras. But we but no, I switched you figured it out. No, I switched the, the, the cameras. I switched the cameras. And one is the my computer camera, which is sucks. And then this is the one I got the 360 Insta Insta Link or whatever it's yeah, called. Insta movement. But, and you sent it to me, and I went to do something else. And, hey, well, see, this this is not too bad. See there? Do you know how many people wrote in and said they love the camera gimmick? Like, now that's their favorite thing, is just you just sort of, like, swaying back and forth like you're on a windy barge. You see here. Whoa. <laughs> just go slowly like this. Whoa. Hey, Dutch. Hey, I like, I like it. Yes. Did you watch the... I'm still recording, by the way. This is all going to be part of the show. Yes, uh, I, d I did watch that stuff. Did you? Right. So, because we've got about, I don't know, half an hour left, we might as well go through the news. 
And we were always going to sort of like shut the shut the uh, interview off at that point and then do the news anyway. So it's actually quite good timing. But there's only a few bits worth talking about. And in fact, there's only really one thing worth talking about. And that's Adam Copeland, the former Edge. Well, there there is another one. Jay oh. Cargill. I didn't even write that down. I didn't think it was interesting enough. What? Oh, yeah, it, it is. Oh, okay. Well, well, hey, we'll get Believe to Jade. Me. We'll get to Jade soon then. Um, and I'll write that down as a note. But the former Edge, Adam Copeland, debuting with AEW. So you saw uh, pay-per-view wrestled. Well, you didn't see the pay-per-view, but you saw the last five minutes. And what do you think? Adam Copeland, the former Edge, the current still rated R superstar, and he's still got the same music. Okay, when he came out, uh, Christian was in the ring. Right? Was that mm-hmm. at the end of the pay-per-view? That was the main event, yeah. And that's when he told him to go F himself, right? No, 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 no. That was the Dynamite promo. See, that's that's what's confused me. I didn't know where it's where. Now, can you, can you, did you just notice I tried to self-censor myself? Oh, why? What were you about to say? I know why, after we went through all the stuff with Jamie... Why we want? Why do we want to cancel the F word? I have no idea, but but it was interesting, and they will do they will do some business off that because how I knew how much and I I thought this he's got a lot of people to go through. He named about six or eight. That's good for six to eight months. So if they if they can keep him, if they can keep him with new fresh talent, and by the time eight months rolls around, they may even go be be able to go as far as a year already out, and that's just booking like one match for a pay per view. Then he goes to somebody else, and but it does take talent to book that. How big, so, how big of a game changer do you think Adam Copeland will be for AEW? Because, I mean, a lot of people go over there and then it's sort of the status quo again. But Edge seems something heard, slightly different. Yeah, I have heard that term, game changer, so many times. It doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. See, now, their big, their big ticket was CM Punk. Now Punk's gone. Now, did CM Punk work with uh, Edge before when they was in WWE? I think they were both heels, weren't they? That's a good question. I don't remember those two ever wrestling, although they probably did somehow. Mm-hmm. So, but if, if you mention one, he mentioned Moxley first. Then he mentioned, uh, who else did he mention? That he- Kenny Omega, he mentioned MJF. Uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, I think he mentioned. Yeah, he did. Brian Danielson, Brian Daniels, or mm-hmm. did he mention him? I'm not sure he mentioned what, him. What, what is his name now? Brian Danielson? Yeah. See, his name has been changed several times. And he's, uh, he, he named a few more, but just by naming them, created more uh, interest in him than he had just walking out there. People have seen him walk out to the ring a million times. But walking out to the ring with a purpose, I think, helped them a lot. Now, it's all up into the booking. It's all up in how they handle and how they book um, Mr. Mr. Adam. And let's see what they can get out of it. Because I think they got a, a, long, a long run. I think a lot of times, I think these... The the talents try to put the ideas in Tony's head, but they don't have the experience that an edge or a Christian have. So I think they'll more or less shoot their angles at Tony and actually tell him how long it can go because they have a feel of, of how hot their, their angles would be with each guy. And they'll, they will adjust from there. So it definitely helped the co- company. It, it definitely helped. But, hey, he could, if he's not handled right, he could be 
he could be almost hitting on zero in about three months. See what I, think, I mean? I think they'll handle him well because he won't let himself be handled badly. I think he's just far too experienced for that kind of thing now. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Him and Christian too. Right. Because it, it, will, it will end up with, with those two, I think. And if they take, if they don't book a match with Adam Copeland and Christian right off the bat, that's what they're shooting for. They can take it a long way. And let's, let's see where they go with it. Well, that's the beauty. That's the beauty about booking to give you some anticipation of what can be and when it will be. So if it gets to eight months from now, nine months or whatever, on some big pay-per-view, you know, it'll, it'll mean something. How because does, we saw we saw the bloodline take this yeah. whole thing for like th- three years. It takes, and I've said this the whole. You've heard me say this: patience takes patience, patience, patience. And sometimes it has you got to have patience just to just to draw it back in. Oh yeah, you can go ahead and shoot the angle with Edge and Edge and uh, Adam. I mean, uh, Christian, Adam and whoever, Adam mm-hmm. and Eve. But see, if you shoot it too soon, it's it's gone. Where are you going from there? So stretch it out as much as you can. Get the anticipation as high as you can. Put a uh, some kind of condition on it that if this happens, this will happen. And they might have something. I wish them luck. I, I really do. Uh, a couple of things. CM Punk and Edge did wrestle a couple of singles matches in 2008 and 2010 and some multi-man matches as well. Uh, do you know, I always think... And I think it's this is because of Mike Tanay, right? So back in the TNA days, a WWE star would go over to TNA, and then they wouldn't be able to use the WWE name they had at the time. Mm-hmm. And Mike Tanay, like almost to like every single time, would go. Everyone knows, let's say Edge as Edge, and he always go, "Hey, what's Adam Copeland doing in the Impact Zone?" And it'd be that every, but it'd almost be a joke every single time. And it'd just say, "Hey, what is so and so the name that you've never heard them by doing in the Impact Zone?" Well, that became a, a nuisance more than later on because everybody knew why he couldn't do it. Yeah. But it never was quite explained. But everybody, it was like, if you know, you know. Hey, team 3D. What a Team 3D do? Uh, I can't even say it now. What a Team 3D doing in the Impact Zone? No one's ever called, called them that t- team before. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, this is a. I, I think this business is. A lot of people think they understand it, but very few people do. And I don't think they know how to handle some of these uh, when they come in with a different character, a different gimmick, a different this, a gimmick, gimmick, gimmick that. It, it's, it's, it's difficult even just weaving your way through the commentary. Mm. So I'm agreeing with you. With uh, Edge and Christian, or Adam and Christian, what do you do as a uh, booker? Let's say you're the booker. How do you, I mean, do you go with those two straight away? Do you team them up for a bit? Do you feud them or do you just keep them completely separate and do their own thing and then come back at a later date? No, I don't keep them separate. I would keep Christian on the periphery. You like that word? Mm -hmm. The periphery, the periphery of the angle. He's there, but he's, he could jump in at any time, but he doesn't. So you keep teasing that and teasing that and teasing that. And sometimes he's there. Sometimes he's not. And then as you go, you have to, and that's the beauty of being an an experienced booker. You interject him when you might need him, but he could be interjected at any time. So in an angle like that, you can't, you can't put the, the wagon in front of the horse. You can really just because then you can't go back. Never do too much that you can't back it up and come back to wh- to where you were. But but we'll see what they do. I'd rather them take their time with this and just throw it to you right off the bat because I think that hurts both of them. I mean, who wants to see Moxley and and Adam Copeland because they've done nothing. You got to do something first. 
So let's see what they do. Now, you alluded, uh, I nearly said alleged, you alluded to it beforehand, Christian and uh, Adam. And this is going to take a while for me to get used to. Yep. Adam and Christian are in the ring and Adam says, hey, I, you know, attacked you or attack your friends because, you know, you're about to do the concerto on the icon Sting and, you know, hey, you went to the barbers with a picture of Sting and you wanted his hair cut for some reason. I mean, I think he started the rap tale at that time, so... And then, you know, Edge wanted, uh, Adam wanted Lex Luger's haircut, and they both went to the barbers together with their pictures. You know, explain the whole thing, a bit of background, Uncle Jay, all that kind of thing. And then Adam says to Christian, let's team up. And then they hug. And then Christian grabs the mic and just goes, F you, Adam, and then walks off. Uh, that was actually good. Yeah. Because you think they've made up. But, he, but see, Christian never said they made up. He just hugged the guy. So, and then I was in the FU and he walks off and that surprised everybody. But, but now it's left everything open. See, if they all join up together now, they got to, they don't have any opponents. They have to create opponents. See, Christian and Adam Copeland, I'm going to have to get used to it too. Now they work kind of together when they hugged and when he pulled back and said FU, now they're apart. And I think the people like that. I liked it because now I got a story to follow. Follow, and let's see how they follow it. Do you know what's good now, booking there is that they didn't hit each other or attack each other. Like, why do you need to? Like, I think in why even do you WWE, need? Why do you need that? You don't exactly. need that. I mean, if you now you're one step ahead of where you need to be. So if they never touch, and uh, Christian can always come back and say. I never did this or did that to you. When he had the chance, he didn't do it. So, again, that's why people watch wrestling, to see what's going to happen. So if I came on here and said, yeah, this is what they're going to do, well, hell, they're not going to do that. I may have my idea of how I'd book it, but yet that doesn't mean that I can't sit back and watch it and enjoy it just like regular fans do. But let's don't rush anything because you burn up, you you burn your angle up, you melt it down right at the core, and then there's nothing to go to. You, you know agree? What? Yeah, absolutely. And do you know what I like about Christian, especially, is that he's just, I mean, on camera with his characters, whenever he's a bad guy, he plays a turd so well. He's just <laughs> a turd of a human being, but he's, he, but he's, he's one of the few people who isn't afraid to fully invest in trying to get the fans to genuinely have animosity with him. Like when he was doing the whole jungle boy, your dad's dead kind of thing constantly. It's like very, I think very few people would have the balls to do it and like fully invest in who is, uh, who is jungle dad's Luke, uh, Luke Perry, Luke, Luke Perry, 90210 fame. And he's the one who's had all the drug problems lately. No, he's who? Who's Luke, Luke Perry? Luke Perry died was, a few years ago. But he did he have a bunch of drug problems before he died? I no? don't I don't think so. I mean How's that? let me just check. No, I've just checked. I think his character on 90210 had drug problems, but Luke's fine. Okay. Then I'm I'm confusing him with someone else. Hmm. But anyway. Booking with Christian. Oh. Uh you were in TNA with him for quite a few years. Yeah. Uh, any stories? With, I don't know, just any booking stories for Christian, I suppose. Well, he had a lot of ideas. I let Vince handle that. So he went to all his all his booking. He either went to Vince or uh, Jeff, I guess. And I remember he was there and he was going to, there was some issue with him. Well, not a big issue, but they, but I hadn't dealt with him that much. So I don't even know why I was brought in on his issue. Because they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. So, but how long was he in TNA? He was in there quite a few years. And uh, I can't give you the exact, I don't know, 2004 to 2008, maybe. That's a total guess on my part. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I think in a way he sort of, you know, his greatest level of success in a way was NWA because he was considered a main eventer and he was main eventing. He held the belts and people took him more seriously. 
And maybe that's the kind of thing he had to do was to get away from the WWE system who only had him as a mid-carder for his entire but run. But didn't he go back to WWE later or no? He did. And his last feud, I think, or one of his last feuds before he ended up like Adam Copeland, sort of getting forcibly retired because of his because of neck issues or injury issues, was for the world title with Randy Orton. So once again, what's the old saying? You know, you need to go away and learn a new hold, come back yeah. refreshed. Yeah, go away and come back so we don't know you and get yourself over again. I just made that up. I don't know if that's ever been said, but (laughs) it it could have been like, but most of the time I heard it was just, just go away. They'd always leave out the part of come back later. (laughs) (laughs) They just say, go away. And like, then, you know, you can't hear them and they go, stay away. Oh, but then they, they, they would deny saying that, but I, I mean, a whole a, a whole new uh, book is now open to uh, AEW, but who actually does the booking there? Well, it's Tony Khan it, and probably a few guys he hangs around with wrestlers, EVPs. I don't know. But see, nothing is a, a trademark AEW angle. You could tell when Vince did something in WWE. And there's still a lot of things I don't really like about the booking is when a guy runs in, his partner's getting the dog crap beat out of him and they play his music and he'll look around and get his cheers in. And then everybody, even the ones in the ring, they all stand and watch. And then, (laughs) and that's the way they do it. Uh, it says here, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Pat Buck, Sanjay Dutt, Tony Schiavone, QT Marshall, and others attend meetings allowing Khan to bounce ideas off them. Different personnel are sometimes brought into the conversations as well, while AEW's main event talents have input on their creative as well. So essentially, it falls down to Tony Khan. My advice, I think he has too many people. I think less is more. How many people does he have? List there ten. Yeah, near enough. Yeah, so two. And three, everybody, four, five, six, everybody seven. has, everybody has a different idea. So, do they all meet at one time, or does Tony have private meetings with them? No, no. It's it's it seems like it's a group setting. Oh, I hate that. Mm. I what, really do. What was the most amount of people in a creative meeting that you ever attended in TNA? Well, probably like seven, six or seven. But the unique part about it, if we, if we just had three <clears throat> and a like a stun sonographer, which is actually Dan Engler, which he's a, he was the recorder. He would type all this stuff down. But I think the less you have, you can focus more. Because the more people you have, if you have three, you're gonna have you're gonna have three different versions. If you have seven, you're gonna have five different versions. So three is enough. Five, you're repeating some stuff, and it may be totally different. But where it really boils down to is the one in charge who has to pick which way we're going to go. Mm-hmm. See, when I booked Puerto Rico and I had myself. And I would start booking the show. I don't know. We booked weekly there, so. Very weekly. Very weekly. (laughs) No, but um, a Monday, I would have like a match or two I wanted next week. And the rest of it, I'd have to book it on the spot. And I never really had this, the long-term deal. I did on the top two matches, two or three matches. I had that. A lot of times it just booked itself. Then when we would do a pay-per-view, we'd the only reason we'd booked that so far in advance is because we'd, if we'd want a guy or two to come in, you know, you just, you just don't book the airplane tickets like the day before you got to have, you got to have them booked about a month out and the rooms booked and the transportation booked. And, but, but it worked. If you got your strong, I kept my strong programs in house. 
I never tried to send my top uh, baby face out against uh, a traveling heel. Because what if that heel doesn't come? Now you don't have the match. Or vice versa, you you baby face, then you book your heel, and something happens, your heel gets hurt, he misses the flight, he does this, he does that. It can actually do more harm than good. Mm-hmm. So I tried to keep my top angles in-house where the guys were already there. I knew they would be there, and that helped get my talent over, over more because – Usually when I brought somebody in, they'd be third from the top unless it was in dire situations. And I, I knew the guy would be there. I could book it on, on top, but very seldom did I book that way. I've got a question for you then. So let's say you are the leader of a booking committee and it has to be yep. a committee. You're the top dog, but you've got to have three living people. So, you know, you can't just have more from history. Three living people today to be your creative underlings. Who would you have on your staff under you? Anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. From any company, you're not hired at all. Who would be your top three guys to bring in to form the Dutch Mantel Wrestling Organization? (laughs) Well, I'd have to to think about that. It's not that who I would have. It would be who could I get. Because I may be for a rinky dink organization that couldn't afford anybody. Let's say let's <clears> say <throat> money's no object, let's say contracts are no object. You can pick the best three people, but you also have to consider personality clashes between those three as well. You would ask me this question, wouldn't you? Okay, I'll take up one of those spots. Mm-hmm. But now the contacts I had, they're about all dead. <laughs> <laughs> they're about all dead anyway. Uh, but I would pick me a guy that's say a, a Cody Rhodes. If money was no object, I, I think I would, I would, I would pick him even may, maybe even Dustin, but there is a guy that, that I had in Puerto Rico. His name is Moody. And the reason being for his Moody name was because he went in and out of moods. <laughs> One day he'd be so happy bouncing around. Next day he'd be so depressed he's thinking about killing himself. And the next day, after you got through dealing with him the first day, you felt like killing yourself. Then the next day you felt like killing him yourself. And, and you want him on your committee. Yeah, I want him on my committee <laughs> because he really had. But see, he offered something different. He was a videographer, and he did tremendous, tremendous videos. Now, this was back in the days you could use uh, copyrighted music, which you can't do that, but you, you still got a lot of music that you could use. And he, he would – sometimes the best part of the show, it was a Saturday night. We, we had our big show on Saturday night around San Juan, he would come up with a six minute or seven minute video that encapsulated, you like that word, encapsulated everything we'd done for a month. So if you'd missed everything, you watch the show, you watch that last video and it, it explains it to you with that. Most of the time without an announcer overlay, without an announcer voiceover. That was the best part of the show. And it, it always did. Uh, it was customary to to watch it to the end because I would usually uh, either show a video on the big shows or I would, I would wrap up my vignettes that I'd done through the show. And then we'd, we'd do the promo, then, then we were gone. I pulled up one baseball stadium one day. It was about six o'clock. They had five lines of people about, a, I don't know, a hundred, 150 deep waiting to buy tickets at six o'clock. And the show started at nine o'clock. Well, it's supposed to start at, it's supposed to start at eight 30, but nothing starts on time in Puerto Rico. It's called actually the, People that live there tell you it's called Puerto Rican time. So 
So it might start, they want to start at 8.30 or 8. It starts at 9, 9.15, and that's the way they do it. So, so we've got Cody, we've got Moody, yep. we've Moody. got one more space left. So would it not be someone established like Cornette or Russo or Jarrett or Kevin Sullivan well, or all, anything like that? No. Well, first of all, you're not going to get Cornette, period. I don't care how much money you offer. And Cornette is a type, and he doesn't like committees either. And he's very, he's moody. I couldn't put Moody with Cornette. They'd kill each other <laughs> because of the of the personalities. Vince is much the same way because he sees it one way and sometimes doesn't see it any other way or may not want to see it any other way. I can, I can respect that. And Jeff could probably do it. But you have to have somebody that's been in the business about 20 years that has seen the old school. And it seems a new school. And so I don't know who that person would be. Could you give me one more example? And I'll say what he'd work or not. Mm, Kevin Sullivan. No, he wouldn't work either. Why not? I just don't. It's just a feeling that he's got good idea, but he's the type that agrees with me. I think he wants less is more because if you have less is more. You sit down and you're trying to explain this angle to a team of consultants. They're going to pick it apart. I went to a meeting one time in TNA, and I don't know why in the hell I would go to this meeting. It was the clerks in the office, and it was another guy that just damn stored stuff. They were all around this big table in the office in TNA. And they were all listening to how we booked the show. Bonnie, one guy spoke up and I says, he said, well, I think I said, let me, let me tell you something, buddy. I don't, I want you sitting there and just listening. I don't want you saying anything. How many places have you booked? No. I said, how many matches have you agented? None. Well, what qualifies you to sit here? Because Dixie Carter just sent them in there. Because she wanted everybody to know where the company was going. And I told her later, I said, I'll tell you what, if you keep this up, I'll tell you where the company's going. <laughs> it's going into bankruptcy. I'm going to tell you exactly where it's going. Because first of all, I'm not going to be here. Jeff won't put up with it. And Vince won't either. Because you just don't go. Here's a guy that just cleans up the office. He's the custodian or the janitor. And he's sitting on a meeting. I walked in the first day. I, I couldn't. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I said, "What the hell is this? What does a damn custodian know about damn a triple main event or this, that, and the other? Or where I want to go or where it, it needs to go?" So uh, that was when I decided that I don't know TNA might not be as as glorious as they try to say it was. Uh, just before I move, right, we've got two more news things and then we'll uh, shut down this podcast. But before I do, uh, someone else I spoke to who used to be a booker, and he says hello, by the way, Bill Eady. I spoke to him on the weekend. Oh, Bill, good guy. Yeah. Very good guy. How's he doing? He's, he seems to be doing really well. Apparently him and Barry Darso are more busy than they've been in 20 years at the moment. They're doing more appearances and got more merch out and stuff like that, so they're doing really good. Uh, we'll probably do mm -hmm. some questions about him and Barry at a later date, but... Because we've got sort of limited time in this podcast, we'll just go on to the news. And uh, Dominic Mysterio once again wins the NXT North American title. Now, you watch the match. Give us your critique of where Dominic Mysterio is uh, since we last spoke about him around WrestleMania time. So, you know, his, his sort of improvements as a bad guy and what you make of him. Well, the more experience he gets, the better he will be. Uh, I think right now he's he's running off that initial heat that he had when he joined Judgment Day. I think he's still trying to find himself as a single performer, even though he has the Ray Ripley out there with him. But it was a pretty good finish, decent finish. It didn't bury anybody. 
And I think they're dealing with a, a guy that got a lot of upside. So, and Triple H, he does have the, 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 a lot of patience of dealing with this guy. That's why he's in NXT. He's learning to do these matches on his own. And he's learning to add a little bit here, take away a little bit there. So, and contrary to a lot of people's beliefs, this business is not easy to learn. It's not. See, I've heard, uh, like WWE, they used to, they would book sometimes a year in advance, which sounds great. And it possibly can halfway be followed, but it doesn't take into account injuries or guys getting pissed off or just can't do it or getting hurt. I think somebody told me that one time Vince knows exactly where he's going a year from now. I said, no, he might know the buildings he's going to. He might know the towns that are booked as far as the actual kinks and the, the nuts and bolts of where he wants to go. No, he has a general idea, but he doesn't have it down yet. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of these guys that you say, well, I want to put them in a main event next year at WrestleMania. Well, they got to get over first. Great looking team, but will they get over? Because you give a team three months, if you don't handle them right, their fears goes away. So, with and a, now he may have he may have booked a year out with with Hogan, because all he had to do was figure a year. He'd only have to figure out maybe two opponents for Hogan. Hogan's say it starts in January. Hogan gets rid of one of the opponents, say at SummerSlam. Then he starts with somebody else for the next WrestleMania or the next big pay per view. It may take it about three or four months. Then they need that other heel to come in for WrestleMania again next year. <clears throat> so that's an art form, and not just anybody can do that. Hell, I, I know how it works, but could I do it today? Maybe, maybe not. With Dominic, he's been, you know, riding the wave of the Rey Mysterio feud for a while, and he's sort of found his feet with the Judgment Day, and he's still one of the biggest, he's one of the people who gets the biggest reactions, positively or negatively, but people are reacting to him more than almost anyone else on the roster. But as you said before, you, you know, the Rey Mysterio feud, the father-son feud, it's still very fresh in people's minds. And if he's riding that wave at the moment, how long can you ride that wave before you need something just as big to continue the momentum? That's... How would you continue the momentum? The temperature in the room, they'll tell you. You can feel it cooling off because he's hot. He's hot right now. When he goes to the ring, you can't even hear him do an interview. And that may be turning the sound up a little bit just on your TV broadcast. But the people will tell you how far you can go with it. As long as they keep him in a position where he can keep pissing those people off, not necessarily working, but just being presented to the people. Uh, I think he's got a, he has a long run. I think one thing that will help WWE right now, I think would even help uh, Dirty Dom, a thieving bastards, stole my name. I think having Randy Orton challenge Dominic, I think would, would create interest. Mm. Why Randy? Because he's been out for a year, a year and a half, but maybe more. And he's over. So when he walks out there and he don't have that Matt Riddle to carry that excess baggage, all that, all those problems that guy had. And if he comes out there and Randy Orton is a loner anyway, because he works better in that loner and the loner fashion. And again, if you put him out there, give him a good interview or a, a good way to intersect Dominic 
and he ends up slapping Dominic or Dominic ends up slapping him, one or the other. That's all you need. You don't need an ass kicking. You just need a, a slap because that's embarrassing. And, you know, when you punch somebody, you got you got to go find it. If you slap somebody, they have time to – because you get that uh, – you don't see a slap that much, not with guys. <laughs> a slap either way. I think Dominic may be slapping him, Orton, or the other way around. I think creates a lot of interest. So, and then you have you have Orton stalking him and take it to a pay per view, and he can actually beat Dominic there because that's what the people. <clears throat> this is a very important move. The first time these guys meet, that's why the finish is very important. Either way, you gotta, you know, I prefer that the, the heel beat the babyface. I mean, the uh, babyface beat the heel because then you get a big pop. But then you got to kind of rebuild it again and you're rehashing yourself. Mm -hmm. So, but you got to be careful when you introduce a guy like Orton that they haven't seen for t two years and then you beating him right out of the block. That's a very, very touchy situation. But leave it to those guys in WWE. They got good finish guys backstage. It doesn't have to be a complicated finish, just a good one <laughs> that maintains the heat. Or you can get a real Ripley in there. So a lot of ways you can do it. But I think Randy Orton coming back, actually against anybody, would, uh, especially Dom, I think he has, they would have instant, what they call synergy. Mm -hmm. I mean, combined energy together. And I, I I would actually like to see that match. Symbiotic, that's a good word. I thought that was a disease. No, uh, no, I Sym cured that. Symbiotic. Ago. Symbiotic. Yes, yeah, sy symbiosis or uh, uh, symbiotic <laughs> is two completely disparate entities coming together and working very well. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Why didn't I say that? Because it's a I good, said that. that's, that's I the best word of the podcast, symbiotic. I oh, like yeah. It. oh, yeah. Uh, you want to talk very briefly before you shut the podcast down about Jade Cargill, and they're making a great big fuss about her coming in as well. Okay. What was she making in uh, AEW? Any You're, idea? You, absolutely no idea. Uh, Tony Khan apparently recently, this off the top of my head, he actually talked about the contract negotiations, and Jade said, I want this amount of money, and Tony said, well, maybe a bit less. And then Jade said, well, I'm going to WWE. So he ended up matching the offer that she, uh, sorry, not ma matching the offer, but uh, meeting Jade's it. demands. And then Jade went, eh, still going to go to WWE. Tony ups it again to more than what Jade was initially asking for. And then Jade still goes to WWE. So I suspect she's making very, very good money. And they're, and they're promoting her as someone who they've got a lot of investment in already. Well, She's different. She looks great. Now that they, they got a few girls. See, this is, I don't have anything against the, the girls in WWE, except some of them are so very small. Like, uh, what's that girl's name? Alexa that, Bliss, she was tiny, wasn't she? Tiny, tiny. Then they got a few more, but they got Nia Jax there now. And Rhea Ripley got her there now. That Rodriguez girl, they got her there. Now with Jade Cargill, she weighs 170 pounds. But she's kind of tall. She's like 5'10". She's big for a girl. So she will have some opponents. And these girls are used to working. So you got to be careful when you work with these Smaller women, you can hurt them by not meaning to. That Nia Jax, when she comes down on you, she's a little bit, I don't want to say clumsy, but she could be. And when she, those girls can't take that. If it was a guy, that'd be different. But some of these girls are so fragile looking, really, that there's only certain people that they, they can work with. But I, I think if you put all these four 
together at one time, not in the ring together, but just to expose them. Hell, they got enough between the four of them to go for a year anyway. So you would have, Tania Jacks would have three angles. She could go with, I don't know, she could go with Rhea Ripley for a while. Becky Lynch, Charlotte. And, and Lynch gone. and Charlotte. I don't think they match with Charlotte that much anyway. Mm-hmm. I really don't. So I'd rather see the, but you, you do have Becky Lynch, like you said. You have Charlotte. Who else would you have there? Oscar. Oh, oh yeah, the Japanese girl, Oscar, and the other one, Eagle Sky. Mm-hmm. Now, those Japanese girls, to me, are the most talented there. Because these girls, they're not big, but they're tough as nails. And that would be actually a good finish for Neil, Neil Jax because she's already ha- she already has that reputation of hurting people. So what if she hurt one of them? But yet it's, it's preconditioned, it's predetermined, but they could just pick a spot at any part of the match where one of those girls gets hurt and they bring in the gurney and they take them out. People seriously would believe that. I think uh, would you just, would you believe it? What if Nia Jax sat on me or sat on someone and sent them to hospital? Yes, I would. I would like her sitting on one of the fan in the audience, and then taking them out on a on a stretcher, a gurney, hmm. and we interview them right before they put them in the ambulance. How was it? How was it, ma'am? Oh God, <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to kill me. Anyway. It could work. You know something, you know something, James. If you'd get a little more serious about this stuff, so I could work for AEW in their creative department. Hey, they got it set up for them. It's up to them now. Mm. We've given him their ball and let them run with it. I think we're going to shut it down there now. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. Thank you for joining us, especially with uh, Jamie Dundee, our guest. Uh Tremendous. I don't know. I'm, I'll I'll see how I feel. I'm, I might let one slip through just so people know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> for now, thank you very much for watching. You know, we've got merchandise, as you know. We've got books. We've got certificates. We've got, well, Dutch has anyway. I don't. Uh, and if you want all that, go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. We will see you again on Tuesday for our fan question answer session that we do every single Tuesday which you can send in your questions at questionsfordutch at gmail.com, and, and the best ones make it into the script. I have actually I, I had a, a glimpse of some of the questions. I think these are the best questions that you've gotten in a long time. You think? Oh, I think so. There you go. What heck of a tease well, then? Well, so well, the best well, questions. Why didn't... What if I said these were the shittiest questions I've ever seen in my life? I've said no. that a couple of times. Prior you to have me. not said that. I've said, oh, God, we've got some rotters in this week of <laughs> questions. <laughs> no, but those those questions are very good. Yeah. So. Well, there you go. Uh, what a perfect tease then. So we'll see you on Tuesday for the fan question answer thing. And for now, Dutch, we the people.